Hello and welcome to Talk Into History, the podcast where we, Matt and Max, talk about works of alternate history, alternate history scenarios, and history in general. This episode, we're going to be talking about sliders. <laughs> <laughs> The greatest television show ever made. A show that's very near and dear to your heart. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and a little bit to me, too, because I, I remember watching it as a kid. Yeah. But very sporadic watching for me. This is what I'll say about it. When it's great, it's great. Mm-hmm. But when it's bad, oh, man, <laughs> it's, there's some stinkers. It's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. We talked about this for for a while, and I'm yeah. excited that we finally... I know you've watched a bunch of them. Both on and off the air, we've talked about it. And I've watched uh, a good little bit of the show. But to give some context to people who I guess are unfamiliar with it, this is a show that ran from 1995 to... 2000. 2000, okay. And it's a science fiction TV show, but with a little bit of a twist. Yeah. It's not just a straight you know, Star Trek kind of thing. The premise is, is that... Uh, this college student, this physics student, Quinn Mallory, invents this way to transport between dimensions. So you can go to different dimensions that each have their own version of Earth. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk about it when we go through the episodes, but he, he does something wrong and he accidentally sucks in his friend, <laughs> um, his professor, John Rees Davies, and then this other guy who's like outside their house randomly into a wormhole and they're lost and they're trying to find their way home. So they're sliding between different worlds. And why we're talking about it on Talkernet History is that each world is an alternate history. Some more believable and better than others. Some more clear than others. Yes, exactly. Uh, a lot of times they go to a world and what happened to result in this world <laughs> is is really a, a true mystery. Yeah. <laughs> really boggles the mind. Because so, some, some of the premises can be, you know, measured and realistic and some of them are... Com- are completely crazy. Yeah, like so ridiculous, <laughs> off the wall, not believable in the slightest. <laughs> But so that whole premise is they're trying to find their way home. These Mm -hmm. four people. There's five seasons. The first two are those four people. It's Jerry O'Connell is Quinn Mallory, the great one, Jerry. Yes. 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 He of Kangaroo Jack fame. (laughs) Is that right? A movie I've actually seen and desperately tried to erase from my memory. (laughs) Did you see it on an airplane? I wish I could say so. I was young when I watched it. Okay, fair enough. But I watched it. At a house. Okay. And I remember thinking, even then, I was like, ooh, this is... This is not good. This is bad. I remember... Jerry, you've fallen so far from the heights of sliders. (laughs) (laughs) He falls from the show before it's even done, too. Yeah, because... So the first two seasons, it's these four people. So it's Jerry O'Connell's Quinn Mallory. I think it's Sabrina Lloyd as Wade Wells, his his female friend he works with. And then John Rhys Davies is Professor Maximilian Arturo. The best character. Yes, he is. And then Clavant Derricks is Rembrandt Brown, who is this washed-up R&B singer, the Crying Man, <laughs> who um, accidentally gets sucked into the wormhole with them and gets lost with them. With his car, too. Yeah. Which they never do that again. They, they do ne- in one episode. Oh, okay. Um, right. They drive a car into it, which, again, it, it, there, there's a lot of inconsistencies. The writing was sometimes really good and sometimes sporadic. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of the way through the third season, um, they get rid of the professor. You know, They kill him off. In a really, really ungracious ungracious way. Undignified. Undignified, completely. Um, And then they replace him with Carrie Wurr, who's Maggie Beckett. Carrie Wurr of Eight-Legged Freaks fame. (laughs) Anaconda. (laughs) And Anaconda, yeah. And what was it? Command and Conquer? Command and Conquer Red Alert 2. Oh, yeah. She was Tanya, one of her best performances. (laughs) Uh, And then at the end of the third season, they drop... Wade Wells, the character, mm-hmm. and then in the next season, it's Rembrandt, Quinn, okay. uh, Maggie, and then they pick up Colin Mallory, who's the long-lost brother of Quinn's character, okay. who's played by Charlie O'Connell, <laughs> the weaker of the acting O'Connell siblings, <laughs> if there's such a thing <laughs> at times. Was that a uh, favor to Jerry? You know, we'll I think it was a favor to Colin. <laughs> <laughs> to keep the landlords off his back. Um, <laughs> no, no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just kidding. Just kidding. Please don't sue us. Um, uh, <laughs> no, but so that's, that's season four. Mm-hmm. And then Charlie and Jerry get knocked out of the series. What mm-hmm. happens is, is that in the first episode of the fifth season, mm-hmm. they're sliding to another world and a mad scientist shoots Uh-oh. a a duplicate of 
Quinn into the wormhole who then collides with Quinn and merges with him. And then it blows his brother into space time or something rather than other, rather other. Wait, 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 wait. Who gets merged with who? Uh, Quinn Mallory gets merged with another version of himself who's different. And that's why he looks different in the fifth season because it's a different actor. But all the other doubles in the show look exactly like them. But this, except for the one that's a woman. Max, you're looking for continuity where there was none to be had. (laughs) Okay, so two of his own doubles get merged merged together. together. All right. And then Charlie O'Connell gets blasted out. And then this other lady named Diana Davis takes over as like the professor kind of character. Okay. Uh, and uh, they go around, and then it ends at the, f- the fifth season ends, and that was it. That was it. So kind of a drop off in quality over time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Significant seasonal rot. Seasonal rot is a good phrase for this show. <laughs> um, and the way we're going to structure today's guest should be a longer episode. The way we're going to structure it is we're actually going to go episode by episode through the first two seasons, which really are the seasons worth watching. And then yeah. we're going to talk about some highlights or maybe lowlights of <laughs> of three, four, and five. Because there's moments of brilliance, and then there's moments of sheer stupidity. So, so yeah, I, I've seen a little bit of three, four, and five, and I've seen more of it, but I haven't seen. I can't make it through all of the episodes. Sometimes yeah. I'll try and watch some. It's on, at least on, they're on Peacock now. Um, hmm. you, you try and watch them, and you're just like, Ugh. Ugh. oh, god. <laughs> oh my god, I have oh, a vague so sense bad. of 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 a headache coming on. <laughs> uh, let me go do something else. Um, <laughs> Well, some of these episodes, I uh, I was doing other things while watching them, because mm-hmm. let's be honest, it didn't demand my full attention. Um, That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it shouldn't. This but, is not like, you know, well, this isn't The Sopranos, this isn't The Wire, you don't have to be locked onto the screen. Right. You know, you don't, you don't have to watch the episodes in order, you know, that mm. sort of thing. Well, I do know that they aired them out of order, too, in some mm-hmm. places, so yeah. it's like, the timer works differently now, except that gets introduced later. So for some reason, they're just sliding in a different way all of a sudden. Yeah. Like again, continuity is not yeah. always the strong suit here. But. Uh, studio meddling. A, a lot, lot of, of studio that, meddling. Yeah. yeah. Which I'm sure we'll get to. It's almost shocking that the show lasted as long as it did, given how much infighting there was. But mm-hmm. and also the show was it was created by Tracy Torme, who I think was big on Star Trek: The New Ge- The Next Gen. Uh, oh, was he like a writer? Or I think something? he was a writer or producer on it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. He's there's... the son of famous singer Mel Torme, who actually makes an appearance in an episode we'll be talking about. A, a wonderful appearance. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, well, good on him. T- TNG is a good is a good show. Mm-hmm. Actually, there's a couple episodes in this that are a little similar to episodes in the Next Generation. So I wonder why. Um, <laughs> I wonder why. Hmm. All the world wonders. <laughs> It's like at the Battle of uh, Leyte Gulf, the world wonders. Yeah. Oh, that's, no, you're thinking of it's Sirago Strait. It's the Wade Dudley. Oh, okay, okay. This piece may be necessary to continue the fight against fascism, but we shall never forget Sirago. That's like one of the quotes from that story. I love it. Okay. okay. Wade Dudley, you're the best. Um, Ten four. (laughs) But yes. Well, let's get back on track. We've got a lot of sliders to get through. There's so much sliding to do. Yeah, we've got to... Let's slide on to the next to to begin. Well, let's um, talk about the pilot mm-hmm. first episode, and there's a real seal of of quality on it while watching it. You know, it's clearly made for television, but there's like a patina of money and effort yeah. that's obvious. And it was a two part. It was like basically the pilot was a two parter, so it was ba- basically a television movie. Yeah, yeah. And I agree. This is a good episode. If if any of you are listening to this who've never seen it, and you're like, hey, I want to watch this. Uh, this is definitely an episode to watch. Not only is it introduces it, the production values are super high. Yeah. Almost about as high as it will get on this show. Yeah. And yeah. and it really shows. And because it gives, we were talking the other day or texting about it as we were preparing the episode. And I said something like about sometimes, I think a good way to summarize this show is often it misses the mark on the big stuff, but will hit it right on the head with the smaller things yeah. that flesh out the world. Yeah, yeah. It, even in an episode where like the plot is confusing or not that great, mm-hmm. there's still stuff to appreciate in there, in the background, which uh, will oftentimes save an episode. Yeah. So the pilot. Yeah, so long story short, Quinn Mallory, yes. Jerry O'Connell, <laughs> who first of all, let's just start out with, doesn't look like the guy who's going to invent interdimensional travel. No, No insult to him. You know, I'm sure he's a, an intelligent fella, but he does he just does not fit the stereotype of a super genius. He looks like he should be in a JC Penney catalog. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's moments where he's not so great in this series, but he's actually pretty good. He's not a bad actor. He's believable in this. He also directs a few episodes, too. Yeah. Yeah. 
so you have this. So he is this physics student at Berkeley, I guess, or some mm-hmm. version of it. Yeah. There's hints that the world they're in, they call it Earth Prime or, or our home world. Mm-hmm. It's not our world, but whatever. Um, mm-hmm. he, he's experimenting with anti-gravitational device or something, trying to invent it, and he invents sliding. Yes. He invents these worm, this wormhole. Yeah, yeah. But then he operates with a remote control. It's either a, a TV remote control or a cell phone. I think it may be a cell phone, that one. The okay. later one is the mm-hmm. one with the slide like an Egyptian, which we will definitely <laughs> talk about because <laughs> there is a whole lot of shit Jesus. to unearth in that one. <laughs> what an episode. But... Um, but yeah, he like invents it in his basement, yeah. and um, he's like taking all these like VHS recordings of it, which is a great framing device. You're like watching these VHS tapes, and he's like throwing stuff into it, and mm-hmm. he invents this timing device. So he goes through, and in his professor is Professor Arturo, who is John Rhys Davies, this English professor teaching in California, and he works at this computer store with his with Wade Wells, who clearly has a crush on him, but he's oblivious to it. Yeah. And then you also see. Shots of crying man Brown, Rembrandt Brown, and he's trying to revitalize his career. He's he's apparently supposed to be like like a version of Lionel Richie, kind of like R and B late sixties, early seventies singer. I can see that, yeah. And he's he's on his way to sing the national anthem yeah. at the start of a football game, a 49ers uh, game. It's a no, it's a Giants game. It's a baseball game. Oh, got it. Okay, okay. So and and, and this is set in San Francisco. By yes, the way. San Francisco. Yeah, and it was shot in. Vancouver, the series, Mm -hmm. but they did a lot of like wide, you know, second unit shots in San Francisco. So it feels like, especially in the pilot, like you're in San Francisco. And when you told me that I was surprised because I had no reason to think that it wasn't San Francisco. If it looked realistic to me. So he invents this timing device and he, he goes through the wormhole to see where it leads and he lands in his basement and everything seems like it's the same. And he Mm -hmm. goes out and he gets in his car and there's this funny thing. So at the beginning of the episode, he's listening to this crazy shock jock spaceman. I I think he's a Simpson voice actor. It's Harry Shearer, who's principal Skinner in this, in the Simpsons (laughs) and many other people too. But, um, he's like listening to the radio and he like goes through a green light and like almost causes a traffic accident. And people are like, it's a green light for crying out loud. And they're like stopped at a green light. And then the red goes to red. And then they start going. He's like, what's going on? And the guy on in the radio, the Simpsons guy is Harry Shearer is like, and we're hearing all about global cooling. And today vinyl won the battle. The last CD rolled off. And he's like, and Jack Kennedy, you know, he's in the White House. And when you wake up next to Maryland, why wouldn't you want to just stay there? And, and then he's like, what's going on? And then he like stops and looks up and there's a big billboard that says Elvis live at the Mirage. And he's like, oh my God. And he has to drive through the lights. And it's, they really, I guess, went to a portion of Vancouver and they got some permission and they're, they, people, the cars are driving through at the red light and stopped at green. <laughs> <laughs> and then he gets back and he gets, you know. So like tons and tons of divergences that almost seem at cross purposes of one another. Like how the hell did all this stuff oh, converge? And, and, and people are fleeing over the border into Mexico for jobs from the United States. That's right. Yeah, that too. That too. And his mom is like pregnant an affair or something. With oh, the pregnant. gardener. With the gardener. Yeah, yeah. Or she's married to him or something. But Yeah, because his dad is like dead. His, his dad in, died in an ac- a car accident. It says okay. he died in a car accident. Right. Um, hit by a car. Um, so then he gets back and he gets sucked back to his world and he's like, Oh my God, I did it. And he goes to tell everybody and the professor's angry at him. And then Wade Wells is like, you got fired. And don't you remember kissing me? And then it turns out he, he goes back to his house and there's a double of himself. And how would you, well, how would you describe a double? A double is a cost cutting measure to have more than one character, but played by the same actor in an episode. Uh, but in the in the context of the series, a double is just the same character in a different universe. So, like later on in the show, a, very often they'll go to a universe and then they'll find a version of themselves, and it's sort of them, but it, they're different in some way. Mm-hmm. But in this case, it's Quinn from a different universe who is also a slider, and he slid into their world. And uh, I guess has taken over Quinn's life. Yeah, uh, he decides to like fuck it up by getting him fired and <laughs> pissing off, pissing off his boss and kissing this girl. And it turns out that guy, the the double, is married, so he's like kind oh, of yeah, a cad. That too, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna love sliding, he says. Yeah, which makes you wonder what this guy's been doing. Yeah. <laughs> in his off time. Yeah, like. I can just do whatever I want and get away with it. Ha ha. <laughs> like it really lends itself to some terrible people doing yeah, this kind of to stuff. To really exploit it. So, yeah. but yeah, and then he completes this formula to sliding whatever. And Quinn invites over the professor and Wade mm. and he's going to test out the, um, 
and we're going into very much detail on this other just, episodes just because be like, it's the pilot yeah yeah you know. they're like well we're gonna go through this and the professor's like we have to study this and blah 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 and wade's like no come on like let's take a spin around the universe and he's like okay well we need lots of power so he like turns it he turns up the the timer which again you look at it and it's like how is this little device <laughs> creating a rift between universes that they can travel through so why is this how could they convert a cell phone a 1995 cell phone into this it really does make me wonder what how how the sliding machine works it's it's the it (laughs) you're asking too many questions max (laughs) they actually never explain that like what shoots out this thing that opens a wormhole and and is the timer making the hole or is the hole going to appear and the timer just just tells them where it's going to be and it just opens it up a little bit extra. Max, Max, I, you're asking <laughs> way too many questions <laughs> that there are no answers for. And if there are answers, they're contradicted later yeah. in other episodes. So he cre- he puts too much power in the wormhole and it sucks them in. And the wormhole then just goes flying through space and it goes through certain things, but doesn't suck them through. It only sucks the people through. In an amazing special effect, by the way. Actually, looks- that... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, they, s- I'm sort of joking yeah but i mean for the time it looks really good. yeah for the mid 90s and then it goes out in the street and it sucks up rembrandt in his car mm-hmm. and they're on a world that's like it's a nuclear winter world or something something but they have like a their dog is different or something their dog yeah, didn't there's run certain away. there's certain things that are different he like can tell from the pictures in their house yeah because it's all frozen over and I guess it froze recently. So that so they're in Quinn's house. So they've gone to a different universe, but they're in the exact same spot. Mm-hmm. And they go into Quinn's basement and they find more science equipment, but it's mm-hmm. not a sliding machine. It's like a time machine. Or oh, something? that's a different episode you're thinking of. That's the last days. That's the asteroid episode. Okay. We'll get to that. Okay. Yeah, we will get to that. I'm, I'm kind of, these are kind of blending together a little bit. But basically it sets up the idea that they can go to places they're familiar with where and they'll find things from their own personal life. So they'll go to Quinn's house or they'll go to the university or whatever to yeah. like be used in plots later. Yeah, absolutely. So they're on this world and they're on a, for a certain amount of time, it's like five hours or something like that was the amount of time they gave them. Hmm. And then there's like a, a tornado coming. So they advance the timer. They activate it before the time's up and they get sucked through. They go through it. And for some reason they like shoot it up into the sky. So they have to like, it's sort of, why won't you just put it directly in front of you so you can walk into it? Why would you shoot it up in the sky where you have to like, and, and you can't take your car with you this time. Yeah. Too. Um, and, they go through it and they're on the next, they're back in home and everything looks good. Yeah. And that's part one, I think, mm-hmm. right? That's the end of part one. Yeah. Yeah. And then the beginning of part two and then they're looking around and everything, they're back and it's so nice. And then the professor's like, my God, when did they put him there? And he's like, what you mean? Abe Lincoln. There's like an Abe Lincoln statue in the park. And he's like, no, Lenin, Lenin. Oh no. And then, and it looks like a statue of Lenin. See that's, <laughs> and that's where the, these high production values are, you know, and, um, I think there really is a statue of Lenin in Portland, Oregon, or somewhere like that. Oh my God! Somewhere are you on the West me? Coast. Yeah, oh, yeah, geez. for real. It's somewhere, but it's like on private land, and somebody used their own money to pay for it. It's yeah, not well. like taxpayer money paid for this statue yeah. of Lenin. No, the, no. The city of Seattle would like to honor the the great, <laughs> the great <laughs> humanist and protector of human rights, Vladimir Lenin. But it's actually interesting. The professor says he goes, he goes, Nikolai. Lenin. He says, like, my God, it's Nikolai Lenin, which is not, which hints that maybe the world they're coming from is not ours. Uh, instead of Vladimir. Uh, but Lenin isn't even his real name, right? It's Vl- Vladimir Ilyich. Ulyanov. Ulyanov Vladimir yeah. Ilyich Ulyanov. So maybe his, uh, maybe his nom de guerre is just Nikolai in that world. It's I a minor know. change. Who knows? Either way, so they're on Soviet controlled world. Mm-hmm. And this is the world where the Soviets won the Cold War and have occupied the United States. <laughs> What do you think of this, Max? This this episode is a lot of uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> There's like little things like there was a crazy guy, homeless guy in the park who was yelling about communism, know, the, communism, you know, the oppression of capitalism, all this stuff. And now this guy's like a, a party operatic. Yeah, in this <laughs> world, in the in their original world, he's like the home crazy homeless guy. In the new, in the Soviet world, he's like running for the Senate, whatever that means. <laughs> It's um, I'm going to guy? the Duma in Washington D.C. <laughs> Jack Rady is here, you know, <laughs> from that uh, from that one story. So yeah, so it's a it's communist world. It's like People's Telephone and Telegraph, and that's like on a on a um uh, a phone booth on a phone something. booth, and the money is red instead of green. <laughs> that's right, because they try to pay for something with green money. Money and the guy's and like, like, what the hell is this? Yeah. Or something. Like if you that. look at the money closely, I think it's Lenin on it. Okay. Okay. Um. So you have that. So. 
they get involved with the American underground. And it turns out Professor Arturo's double is Citizen General Maximilian Arturo. And then Wade is du- Wade's double is the leader of the resistance. This like 23-year-old girl. <laughs> And, you know, and like they have like the people are wearing like these shirts that look like the, you know, that's that famous shirt where it's got like the person holding the AK-47. Mm-hmm. But instead, it's like the Statue of Liberty holding an M-16, uh. <laughs> stuff like that. And then they get involved and they, you know, Rembrandt gets captured because he goes off to try and get to the Giants game. And it's funny because he's like in the car going and he's like baseball to the to the the Russian cabin. He's like baseball ski. He's like Reds game, Reds game. You know? <laughs> Cincinnati Reds. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess they're all Reds now. <laughs> um, but um, and this is like a hellscape, this earth, like people are getting shot in the street and you get arrested for no reason. And, yeah, it's a dystopia. Yeah. And uh, uh, Rembrandt gets sent to court as well. Oh, yes. Max, please explain. This oh, is my amazing. God. It's so great. It's the people's court. Literally the people's court. Judge Wapner is there. Yeah, Judge Wapner from the people's court is there. But this is not that the people's court. This is the people's court. <laughs> <laughs> and what does he get sentenced to? Fifteen again? years. There's no trial. It's just you know, and and he goes fifteen years. Don't you mean fifteen dollars? <laughs> That's Rembrandt. Um, and then, yeah. long story short, they help the resistance break out Wade's double, but she gets killed. But like the resistance will live on. Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. And Arturo has to pretend to be his double. Yeah. To try and and break it doesn't in. work. Well, it, it works at first, and then they call, you know, and, mm-hmm. and there's some really bad Russian accents mm-hmm. at various points in the episode. But long story short is they then slide off, and they think they're back home, and then they're eating dinner with Quinn's mom, and then his dad walks through the door, and they realize they're not home. Okay, yeah, yeah, because his dad they, died. Is and now they have to find their way home. Yeah, yeah. Does that lead directly into the next episode? No, it doesn't. No, it really should go into the Summer of Love, that one, the, the hippie one. And we can do that, or we can just talk about the various episodes. So the way the episode, they sh- the, the order they shot it in, or? That was the order they shot it in. Okay, okay. But they aired it out of order. And if anybody wants to watch the show, you can look that stuff up pretty easily to figure out the way you're, quote unquote, supposed to watch it in. Mm-hmm. Um, Summer of Love is a lot of fun. So they, they, they warp in... And the city streets are empty. You know, all the windows are boarded up and there's like something on the news and they're talking about how deadly Venezuelan spider wasps are coming. <laughs> A giant cloud of them is is coming to the city and they've evacuated the city. And they've somehow managed to combine spiders and wasps. So they <laughs> slide to the next world. <laughs> Yeah. And they get separated, like the tunnel closes and they reopen it and the timer's like shorting out and not working and Yeah. But Talk about the world they land in, Max. So, so, so yeah, they get to this world and they kind of get separated because of like some timer nonsense. Like uh, they're still playing with the concept of the series or whatever. Uh, Wade and Rembrandt go in first and they end up in the woods somewhere. And then Arturo and uh, Quinn show up in a completely different place, but the same universe. And oh my God, Wade and Rembrandt start talking to this large group of hippies. They landed in a commune. Yeah, they're in like some weirdo hippie commune. And I was thinking, oh, no. Oh, God, this episode's going to be bad. I don't want to watch this. It's going to be stupid. But totally wrong, because this episode's actually a lot of fun. It is. <laughs> and funny enough, one of the the main hippie is played by Barry Pepper. Yes. You uh, told save, me about that. <laughs> saving Private Ryan in Battlefield Earth fame. <laughs> Um, oh. but, uh, so Quinn and the professor go and try and fix the, the timer, mm-hmm. but the world they've landed in, there's all these hippies everywhere and it's like the summer of love and it's 1995 and they landed in a world mm-hmm. where the divergence is. And this is sometimes like they'll have, they'll have like exposition explosion where like the, <laughs> one of the characters will explain what, what the divergence of the world is. But I appreciate it because it's better than trying to figure it out yourself. Yeah. And if they don't explain it in some of the later seasons, you're not really sure what the change is, but, um, in this world, the U.S. lost the Battle of the Coral Sea. Yes. Um, and Japan invaded and apparently conquered Australia. And they said, when the European War ended, Russia entered the Pacific War and liberated North Australia, while America liberated South Australia. And now North Australia is attacking South Australia in a mimic of the Vietnam War. This, this begs many questions. <laughs> so many questions. <laughs> so first... Well, also, they, they also, the hippies mentioned at one point, they don't know what astrology is. So actually, the changes apparently date back from before yeah, the Coral Sea. Because that's quite old. But the Soviets enter the war and they invade North Australia. Okay. <laughs> How much farther could you get from the Soviet Union? And guess what's a lot closer? Like, a lot closer 
Japan. Japan. <laughs> so you're telling me they invaded China, Vietnam, Korea, Korea, the Philippines, Indonesia. I guess Taiwan. As Taiwan, well. like yeah. Thailand, all the way to us to Australia. And what the hell was the U.S. doing? Were they just sitting on their ass in New Zealand, just going, "Oh no, oh, no"? Europe first policy. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah. no, no attempt at an island hopping campaign. Europe only. That's right. Yeah, exactly. We don't care about the Pacific. And why would the Russians need to get all the way to Australia to defeat the Japanese? Imagine this. Also, for so one, this war must have ended in 1947 or 48. World War II must have gone on forever. It's like that uh, that story that Argon Trash did, the uh, MacArthur newspaper thing, where it's like the Battle of Tehoku was the end of World War II. And it's like, what? Taiwan? <laughs> the final battle was in Taiwan. Huh. Huh. But, um, but yeah. So, like, it's, it's like Cold War paranoia on steroids yeah. in the modern era. The Cold War is still going on. For some reason, that has caused the delay of the hippie movement until the 90s. Yeah. It's very strange. Oliver North is president in this world. And there's a button, a President Ollie button you see at one point. But the best part about it is, is like when they land in the commune, hmm. Rembrandt and Wade are like, what year is it? And the guy's like, 1995. Who's the governor? Pete Wilson. Who's the president? And he goes, Oliver North, man. Great scene. <laughs> of, uh, of Black Ops 2 fame, Oliver North. There yes. you go. Ollie. Good old Ollie. Um, so you have the professor and Quinn find out this way to jerry rig the timer so that whenever they land on a world they know how much time they have to be there until they open the vortex to go to the next world and if they miss it they are stuck there for 29 or 28 years 29 years Some, something like that they something. mentioned it a few times yeah so uh, and so it's always a race against the clock every episode yeah um yeah. but so they have the timer and they fix it and they're looking for rembrandt goes out to for some reason to go look for them and he for some reason goes to a house he used to own years ago and he finds his funeral is going on oh, yeah he's a soldier who's <laughs> fighting in south australia and he's been reported missing in action yeah and they're instantly having a funeral i guess yeah mm -hmm. and he like shacks up with his double's wife but she turns out to be like a wife from hell and his like kid hates him and it's funny that this funeral scene is funny it, it's just ridiculous it's like huckleberry finn where you show up to your own funeral and oh my god uh you know but um so the quinn and the professor find this out but their landlord is this like lunatic who like reports him to the fbi and they for hijinks the fbi thinks they're building a bomb and all that and at the beginning of the episode you see the fbi back on their world is talking to Quinn's friend Benish, who's a funny character oh who pops God. every now and then. I love Benish. <laughs> he's great. <laughs> he's like the stoner, like, yeah, super he's a genius. complete stereotype. Oh yeah, and in that episode, they they find his basement and they find like the equation mm -hmm. and stuff, and they're like, "What's going on?" Hmm. The bridge, Benish. What is it? <laughs> the the Einstein Putsky. Padau Padowski. Einstein Rosen Padowski Bridge. Is Padowski a real? Thing? I don't think so. I think it's Einstein Rosen. Is really yeah. Yeah. Good old Padowski. You know, Which he, maybe that's another sign this is a different world, uh, that Earth Prime is not our Earth. Yeah. Um, but they also run into Benish's double on this world, but he's like this pro war, young Republican, clean cut. Because like he usually has long hair, and this he's got like a short, short hair, and he's like, patriotism, conformity, not dirty words. You know, I'm in favor of the war in Australia. You know, um, stuff like that. Awesome. Yes. But Rembrandt's, they find out that Rembrandt's double actually isn't dead and his wife chases him out with a shotgun. Well, understandably. But like it has a little interesting note. It says Rembrandt's commanding officer sends a telegram from William Calley, his commanding officer. William Calley is the instigator of the My Lai massacre. Really? Yes. Huh. So I guess he's still in the army in this one. But there's no yeah, Vietnam so. War. The Vietnam War waits until the 90s to happen in hmm. South Australia. South Australia. This also is a world, I wish they would explore more. This is a world where basically all of Asia is under the control of the soviets it must be yeah yeah is there a sino-soviet split is there a, an independent chinese communist party so many questions i have no idea Max. so many questions but long story short they reunite they slide off this world and they keep going to different ones mm -hmm. uh what's the next one in order? i think it's prince of wales oh my god prince of wales this one's fun it's yeah, a, a fun it's one. british america that's the divergence. And they show up and everyone drives like Bentleys or whatever. They're all British cars. Land Rovers are all over the place. It's kind of goofy. Um, everyone speak. Most people speak with English accents. Mm -hmm. Much like the communist world, there's rebels there. They're called the Oakland Raiders. It's very funny. The Oakland Raiders. And they have crossbows instead of like, oh. they have some guns, but mostly crossbows for oh some reason. God. Maybe because, you know, gun control. That's mm -hmm. a British that's thing. Yeah, so. it is a British thing. And like part of the episode, it's kind of... It, 
doesn't really make a ton of sense. Like, Arturo's double is once again an antagonist. The sheriff of San Francisco. The sheriff of San Francisco. Why they would call it San Francisco is why the British would call it San Francisco. I don't know. So many questions. So many questions. Well, you know, San Francisco was originally a Spanish city, so they took it from Spain in a war, I guess. I guess. I guess. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the flag that they have is the Hawaiian flag, which nice. is kind of funny. It's got the Union Jack on it. So yeah, and they Arturo's double, they pretend to be him, and they take a car, and it turns out this is a world where George Washington was captured and executed. The little colonists lost the Revolutionary War. The world is mostly run by a bunch of different monarchies. Mm-hmm. And France and Britain are fighting. In fact, it says King Thomas is lost on the battlefields of France. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I do remember that now. And there's lots of good newspaper. Like, if you look at the newspapers, there's, like, funny... <laughs> that's um, what that's a hallmark of especially the earlier seasons mm-hmm. is like the effort put into like putting maps on the wall and putting like newspaper articles and stuff that you can see very briefly but if you like freeze frame you can c- kind of look at them little things that flesh out kind of like the draca um the, the appendices the appendices yeah. yeah yeah they flesh out the world uh, um so in this world the sheriff is evil arturo he's trying to kill prince harold the the successor to the king and yeah. he says stuff like Prince Harold, who, as you pointed out, may have brain damage or... <laughs> Maybe severely inbred, which is causing some <laughs> mental deficiencies. Like, they keep explaining to him over and over, we're from a different universe. This version of Arturo here is not the same as the Arturo that you know. And he's just not getting it. And he's like, he says stuff like, I'm the last of my line. Because the sheriff wants to kill him so he can succeed. Well, newsflash, they have calculated out hundreds, if not thousands of places of who (laughs) succeeds the monarch. And guess what? It's not the sheriff of whatever. It just goes to the cousin. I mean, is sheriff traditionally a noble title? Is it appointed or is it hereditary? I think it's an appointed. It's not a hereditary position. So what the hell, sliders? Tracy Torme. Tracy, you should have been paying more attention. (laughs) So they have. But yeah, the prince is an idiot. The prince is an idiot. A total a total dummy. But they they help the Oakland Raiders reinstitute the prince who's learned the error of his ways, and they save Quinn from the electric chair. Um, <laughs> Quinn's always about to get executed in a lot of these worlds. Yeah, I, yeah he, he finds himself in trouble a lot. He has this like chronic hero syndrome right. that gets him in trouble a lot, which is one of the things like it's not as believable. If people were really doing this, like you'd think they would do their utmost hmm. to go below the radar not attract attention to themselves. Lie low for Lie God's low. Sake. Don't interact. Don't try and get involved. But I get why they did that because that would not be an, a TV show that many people would watch. Like in a lot of these scenes, they'll just slide in and out flagrantly in front of people, and people are not freaking out, being like, "What that? What? What, the, what, what but, was that? What the hell?" Sometimes when they slide out, they're like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they but, never seem to slide in in front of everyone. They're always in a park or something like that, right? Or in an alleyway where no one can see them. Because it would be imagine they slide into the middle of a concert. People are like, "What the? Fuck? <laughs> what is this? Oh my god!" <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so you have that so they cause this the evil sheriff gets arrested mm-hmm. and the prince takes over and he's gonna become the king and they're like giving him the bill of rights oh yeah they're writing the bill of rights from but they, memory but they keep on forgetting they're like the sixth amendment what's the sixth amendment the sixth? oh my god <laughs> and they make up amendments yeah it's kind of rembrandt funny. tries to have them put in an amendment where he says that james brown is recognized as the godfather of soul and they're like, who's James Brown? But it, it, there's also a good scene in this episode where Quinn's trying to rally the Oakland Raiders. And he's like, you know, a chicken in every pot, you know, um, you know, do not ask what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And the people are like, what are you talking about? And it makes sense that in a different world, you'd have different idioms. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do like that. That makes sense. And people are like, what are you talking about? And they're just like utterly confused by what he's saying, which I like because that's exactly what it would be. Yeah, they should delve more into that kind of stuff in this show, you know, when they reboot it inevitably. Well, they're talking about it. Tracy Torme said about six or seven months ago that they're actively working to reboot it. Okay. And when we talk later about later portions of this show, we can explain probably a way they could do it. Okay. I hope they do it because the end of it sucked, so they could really salvage it. Yeah. And it's sliders, so you can kind of just do whatever and... (laughs) 
Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. They just slide out. They're like, yeah. bye, see ya. In front of a whole bunch of people. In again. front of a ton of people, yeah. So No one like tries to detain them and be like, no, we're keeping this technology. We need to figure out how it works. Exactly. That, that little Motorola cell phone you have there. You yeah, know, yeah, it creates I, portals. I'll be taking that. Thank you. I think the next one is Fever. Fever. This one I thought was pretty fun. So I, I initially mm-hmm. skipped it. And uh, I came back to it. It's actually one of the most recent ones I've seen, mm-hmm. and it's pretty darn good. It's a it's a world where a uh, a virus is uh, spreading through society, and the whole world is starting to collapse because of it. Well, it's not a. I think it's a bacteria. Is it bacteria? It's oh, bacteria. Yeah. And that is important for yeah. later. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. It's not a virus, and it like makes your skin yellow. I guess it hurts your liver. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah. It gives you a fever. You hallucinate. Mm-hmm. You know, the Q is what it's called. The Q. Yes. The Q coronavirus. Yes, oh, no. the, the, I'm joking. It's hard to watch that episode in the era of Corona. <laughs> it it kind of is, yeah. And there's like quarantine zones and all this other stuff. But the California Health Commission has like dictatorial powers; they can just like kill you whenever they want. <laughs> the CHC, yeah. Uh, there's people in like bug suits and like the chemical suits and stuff. Yeah. All of it. this is this is the first appearance of Will Sasso in this show. That he's the bald fat guy from Mad TV. And He's good in the show. I, I like him. I, 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 I'm, Gomez I'm f- Calhoun is a character's name. Gomez Calhoun. Got it. Okay. It seems to be his fate to be the guy at the front desk of hotels in this show. It, it just keeps happening over mm-hmm. and over again. There's always the same hotel. There's always the, They always go to the same hotel. And I get it because yeah. it's a set and it's cheap. But. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of the businesses are always the same. Like there's some bar they keep going to. The lamplighter. The lamplighter, right. Which maybe that's a real San Francisco thing. I don't know. Who knows? Well, it's probably a real Vancouver thing because they <laughs> shoot on site. Which, right. which is one thing I want to say generally about this series is that because the first two seasons are shot in Vancouver, they shoot on site for most things. So it actually gives a real sense of depth because – as Max, you've seen some of the later ones recently. Oh my God, yes. They, it gets ridiculous. It's the same. Like, at Series 3 onto, I guess, Series 5, it's just the same street set over and over and over again. And you mentioned, oh, you'll notice the set. And I thought, what? Come on. I've never noticed a set before in my life being reused. But no, it's really obvious. Yeah. <laughs> it's the New York set from Universal. You can see it on the backlot tour of Universal Studios in L.A. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're actually in, in a couple of them. They're at the courthouse set that's used in um, Back to the Future. Oh, okay. All you right. know, with the clock tower and all that. All right. Interesting. But yeah. So yeah. So oh, oh, oh and another thing mm-hmm. in this episode in Fever, most of it takes place at night, mm-hmm. which is another thing that doesn't happen later on in the show. There's like yeah. all this night stuff. Yeah. Um, and just actually really good. And and mm-hmm. and this is a fun little twist. The actual divergence of this world is that it's a world where penicillin was never invented. Yeah. So antibiotics don't exist. Yeah. And then no one else thought of it later. So this horrible illness is easily cured with this wonder drug. Mm-hmm. And and Arturo ends up making it. It's very funny. He, yeah, dumps, like an hour. <laughs> he dumps a bunch of rotten vegetables on a table and uh, is like looking for mold. And Rembrandt is like, Arturo, man, I mean, I know you're hungry, but have some self-respect, man. <laughs> Which... Well, because it's funny because at the beginning of the episode, they're like, oh, we have all this money because they they left a world where like oil wells were going up all over San Francisco. Oh, so yeah. they got a bunch of money for some reason. <laughs> um, which... After I make this point, I want to address the whole money thing throughout yes, the whole please, episode, please, yeah. this whole whole series. But they go to like a restaurant talking about all the things they're going to order. And like they just get these like shrink wrapped hamburgers oh, yeah. and like Rembrandt tries it. And he's like, try a man, break his soul. But to do this to a hamburger is a crime. <laughs> it's so good. He's like the comic relief in the first season. He gets more yeah. serious as the show goes yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. He, he's scared and freaking out a lot in the first season. And some stuff happens near the, at the end of this season, actually. Yeah, at the end of season one, some stuff happens to him and he gets hardened and he becomes much more stern and serious and eventually becomes, it seems like the main character. He does sort of become the main character by the end of it. But yeah, so they just invent penicillin and then it's instantly fixed. And and like Quinn's double is like... He was the guy, so he got it. So it turns out Quinn's double was a medical student. And you made a good point in the notes. Like, what do they study? (laughs) I mean, I guess they study surgery or... Or or maybe they just study like all these BS herbs and roots or whatever. They don't do anything. Remember they go into a pharmacy and it's all like wormwood and soapwort and stuff like that. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Actually, you know what? Now that I think about it, yeah. And then there's like a crazy guy in there who's like, you're like Ted Kaczynski and the Night Stalker combined. And it's like, Ted Kaczynski and the Night Stalker in this universe? <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? I guess I guess they're disease proof. Um, uh, 
Um, well, actually, they're not because the Night Stalker's dead and Ted Kaczynski's old. Right. Well, there's two Night Stalkers. There's the original one and actually the original. There's Richard Ramirez. The yeah. Nice, he's the yeah. famous one. Oh, I was thinking of the Golden State Killer, actually, who is still alive. Barely. But in, in, <laughs> right. Exactly. He's probably in his mid 80s now. When he got arrested and they were like, he was like in court and they were like, do you have anything to say for yourself? And he's, he said something insane like, I had food in the oven. I was just about to eat. I can't believe I got a... You didn't even let me finish my food or something like that. It's just totally what bizarre. The um, Not the craziest thing probably ever said in a courtroom. That's true. Not the craziest <laughs> thing said in a courtroom in a show also. Yeah. We'll get to that later. But um, yeah, they go to a pharmacy and everything's like home. It's like homeopathic and <laughs> here's your... And he's like, I can I have something for a headache. And the guy's like, who, who has a headache? Do you have a headache? Because <laughs> everyone's that's like, a, that's a symptom of everyone's the so scared of, and like they have a great, this is great. They have those infomercials, remember? Yeah, the Australian guys. Yeah, yeah. And they're like advertising all these things to like sanitize your house and, you know. So, long story short, is they introduce penicillin, they save the world. Yeah. And then they go on. And Quinn's doubles like, you know, I'm going to spread this information across because apparently, like, Apparently, they have figured out penicillin, but it's a secret. The government uses it only for the rich and powerful or, or something or like that. No, they hint that the government's using this disease to like kill all the poor people. Uh, okay. It's a way of population control or controlling the population or something. Something like that. Also, Quinn's double has glasses. Yeah. Which... And Quinn also gets tortured in this. Oh, line. yeah. <laughs> yeah, he gets, he gets sprayed down. Um, what a show. <laughs> yes, what a show. Uh, also, MP5s exist in this world, too. Yeah, well, I mean... Who knows? Hmm. You never know. The possibilities are endless. The man. possibilities are endless. So, uh, what's next? Uh, uh, fever. Oh, it, last days. Last days. What an episode. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. This. I was talking to my grandpa recently, and I was explaining the gimmick of sliders, and he said, "Give me an example." And like, I was thinking, uh, <laughs> what's a good example of something different? The one like, where men are pregnant. Yeah. No, don't say that. <laughs> We'll talk about that one later. Oh, God. <laughs> but but I told him that the gimmick of this world that they go to is that, you know, there's this meteor that's about to destroy the world. And the first thing that they And it's going to hit before they can slide out. So yeah. they can't just like... So yeah. they have to they have to solve this world's problem. It's mm-hmm. not just hero complex. We got to be the... Mm-hmm. We got to save the it's world. It's going to hit in two days and they leave in three. Yeah. We I have to save it. the world so we can save ourselves. Mm-hmm. So they're like, oh well, why don't you just blow it up with a nuclear bomb? And they're like, what are you talking about? Nuclear bomb? And Binish, my guy Binish, <laughs> he shows up and he says, yeah, the nuclear bomb. Uh, Einstein was a fraud <laughs> or something like that. Einstein was wrong. <laughs> yeah, Einstein's folly is yeah. what the nuclear bomb is is known as. It's like this footnote in history that yeah. most people don't know about. It's in a museum. And it yeah. turns out, they explain it like obliquely is that Einstein like, got um which is interesting because he really wasn't an integral part of the manhattan project but i guess it's a different world yeah he feels bad about unleashing nuclear weapons mm-hmm. um so he lies he comes up with this thing called the adiabatic limit which says that there's not enough fissionable uranium mm-hmm. in the world to create like a nuclear explosion is just a theoretical concept mm-hmm. and people apparently buy this even though there was plenty of scientists working on that at the time they right buy it. in multiple countries as yes well. exactly so but whatever Sure, okay. sure. Just, and that's part of it is that, and we'll talk about as we get to some of the other worlds we talk about, that the change, if you think about it rationally, why everyone else would go along with it is bizarre, but whatever. Yeah. So they don't use the atomic weapon. And, and Benish says, if they'd had the atom bomb, maybe they could have ended World War II five years earlier. <laughs> 1950? World War II ended in 1950 in this world. Assuming World War II happened in the same way. Maybe... Mm-hmm. World War II somehow is under different circumstances, and that's why Einstein doesn't want to do it. Who the hell knows? Holy crap, though. 1950? 1950. And the change that that should wreak on history in the United States is massive. Massive. And yet the world seems pretty much the same. It does. It does. They should have had like a throwout line of like talking about, and today in occupied Japan, you know, or something like that. Because obviously the U.S. has to invade Japan. Right, right. But yeah, so Arturo and Binish have to team up to make a nuclear bomb. They have the template for it. They, they have they have Fat Man. They have Fat Man, or but fat, they uh, Fat Boy. Yeah, they call it Fat Boy. Little, little boy. boy. Oh, no, Little Boy. Sorry, it's no, no, no. It's Little Boy and Fat Man, but they call it Fat Boy. Fat Boy. Yeah. In this episode, maybe there was only one they didn't make two. Well, he, who knows? Whatever. It doesn't matter. It's We're also regarding. the implosion type, the sphere, yeah, which type. would be Fat Man, because the Little Boy was a gun called the gun type. 
fired like this uranium bullet thing. It's a simpler form. Mm -hmm. The implosion type is actually the 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 first one they ever used. The Trinity device is an implosion type, and so is um, Nagasaki. And that's the more complex one. It's the more other complex, one is just but it's more powerful. More complex, but more powerful. Mm -hmm. The beryllium sphere. Yeah. As seen in The Shadow with Alec Baldwin. Oh my God. What a film. Yeah, what a film. What a film. Um, so yeah, they have to finish it. Now, I guess they have to figure out how to make the detonator work. They have to make all of the things fire at the same time. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I've got to order beryllium and all that. And he just like, gets on the phone and dials. It's like, who do you order this from? And obviously the world is like falling apart because right, they, everyone yeah. knows they're going to die in two days. Like who wants to be the delivery truck driver the day before the world ends, yeah. you know, still doing your job. Yeah. Like, sorry, let me deliver this beryllium to this guy. <laughs> and it shows uh, society collapsing and stuff too. So that's kind of like the B plot is that Rembrandt just goes out to party, to, to party, but to also appreciate life. And, uh, you know, there's some people who are handling it well, like this woman he meets who, um, the actress is Vosh on Star Trek The Next Generation. She's oh. like this character that has a love romance with Picard. Picard's like kind of a loveless weirdo. Like he doesn't really have very many relationships. And this is this lady's like the only one. Her actress is in it. Hmm. And then there's like some people take it not so well. <laughs> they play Russian roulette. <laughs> Russian and roulette and stuff. But it kind of shows society collapsing. So it's kind of fun that you get that other perspective from these mm -hmm. other characters. And then Quinn tries to like go in, reverse engineer his doubles equipment. But the guy was like obsessed with dinosaurs. So he's trying to time travel rather than. Oh, dinosaurs. We'll see some of those later. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> um, uh. So, so long story short. Arturo manages to engineer and then there's like a romance between Wade and Quinn and That's whatever. Right. So. Yeah, but yeah. they, so Arturo manages to Jerry rig the, the bomb and he's going to hide the plans. Cause he like detects that Benish is a little bit crazy. Yeah. He's like, once we have this atom bomb, man, whatever we say goes, America is going to call the shots all across the world. And if you don't agree, pow. Uh, yeah. And then Benish eventually steals back the plans, but whatever. Yeah. But, yeah. but it's interesting. So, there's they load this onto a ballistic missile yeah which yeah. is interesting because it's the federal space agency <laughs> not nasa which is great i love that stuff yeah yeah just make things a little bit different you know and i guess i guess they believe them they're willing to load this onto an intercontinental non-nuclear ballistic missile yeah. um and shoot it up into space and blow up the comet i think it is it it's a, an asteroid it's an asteroid but okay. what's interesting too is is that they talk about the ballistic missile program still came about, but the missiles have to be very large to accommodate large oh. non-nuclear warheads. See, that's great. I like that. Yeah. 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 So they win. They blow up the asteroid. The end. Yeah. They go off to the next world. And then Banesh is like spinning a globe around it and making gun hands at it. Um, <laughs> Which I feel like, it almost feels like some of these episodes, they set it up that maybe they'll come back one day. Because they could come back to this world and it's like this bombed out wasteland or whatever. Yeah. And like Ben Esch is this hated figure or something. I, I don't know. They could have fun with that. They could, yeah. In this theoretical better sliders that didn't exist. You know, season five, they could come back to this planet or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Also, there's that Summer of Love episode where those spider... If you look closely, some of the spider wasps escape through yeah. the portal, but they never come up again in the episode, so... That'd be funny. People are like, oh my God, look at this thing I killed in my backyard. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> I come back like five years later and it's like... <laughs> spider wasp world again. <laughs> Oliver Pres North was President Oliver wasp. North was killed by a spider wasp. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So what's next is... Uh, eggheads? Eggheads, yes. What an episode. This one's really good. It's a really good episode. Yeah, like the they show up at this world. Everything seems pretty normal mm -hmm. until they look up and they see a billboard and Quinn's on the billboard for Nikki? Nike. Yeah, it's Nike, yeah, but, but it's spelled, spelled differently. Yeah. Just think it. Just think it. And he's like got his feet up on a table and uh, they're like, what's going on here? What What's, what's the deal? And, and, and it turns out this is a world that intelligent, smart people are venerated like athletes on our world. Mm -hmm. So like Quinn and the professor are heroes, you know, yeah. people worship him. He's on the Wheaties box. 
And they call them the sliders. The sliders. I'm yeah. Like, oh my God, they must have sliding equipment. The sliders it, are back. But it turns out that Quinn is like a gambling addict and the professor is like this philanderer. Mm-hmm. The, the professor says at one point, he's intellectual refinement is one thing, moral refinement is another. So basically it does this interesting thing of showing like even if everyone is smart and worships, there's always a dark side to a society. Especially no when they become smart. famous. Like yes. once you become famous, yeah. you can have anything you want. That's when... It's funny because the professor lectures weekly at the Mirage Hotel. <laughs> can you imagine that? <laughs> everyone in Vegas stumbling <laughs> like with a hangover out of the casino to go listen to a guy lecture about physics but it, but it's remember it's john reese davies so That's true he's irresistible oh we totally forgot from the prince of wales episode he mm-hmm. his the sheriff character is a book that says everything i say is right oh my god yes and that's that's probably something most people if if people know anything about sliders it's that picture that screenshot because i see that posted on the internet all the time mm-hmm. that's that's fantastic yeah he's got his own daytime talk show which is just like a propaganda mouthpiece for himself yeah yeah the sheriff that's fun even though it's ridiculous it <laughs> it's still fun uh, so we so yeah so go back to egg but heads. eggheads yeah so yeah so they're dealing with quinn has to assume the role of his double because he's like run off he's hiding in the woods yeah they're both of. well allegedly they've slid out yeah but they're they're really but, just they surmise at the end of it they're like they are arturo's like my double's probably in europe with his mistress and quinn's probably just hiding out in the woods or laying low and somewhere yeah because i think like their sliding equipment isn't good enough and it's not there it never it's existed not, yeah it never quinn existed. was too busy like being famous and winning all these awards and stuff like that and arturo's like may i see my work on my sliding machine and it's like you always kept it secret you know oh. yeah because it didn't exist because it didn't exist um <laughs> But story, which which makes me wonder maybe like what Quinn's double came there told him he was a slider explained sliding to him and then slid out but then these guys just decided to no, like use this as an excuse as an excuse yeah exactly so Quinn has to take the role but his his double is a famous athlete because they play this game called mind game mind game yes <laughs> um which is i guess othello with like some changes and how would you max you should explain because I, I would challenge anyone to explain how this friggin' game works there's like a there's like a checkerboard with numbers on it mm-hmm. and there's guys on two different teams and they're throwing a volleyball or something like that to one another there's no dribbling they'll ask them a question where it's like name uh, the heaviest elements in order or something like that. And as they pass, they say the answers. And somehow when you pass it to someone and they say the answer, you capture that square or something. It's really not clear. Yeah. Uh, it's very strange, but people love it. It's like the most popular game and Quinn's the best player. He plays for the UCAL Eggheads. <laughs> um, but they have real life NFL commentators who were famous in the 90s are commenting on it. And it's funny to hear their play by play. But they also say stuff that doesn't make sense. Like they're like, it's not over till the fat lady closes the book. <laughs> Which that does not make sense at all. Yeah. When, when like it's not over till the fat lady sings is a reference to opera. The fat lady is in the opera and she's singing. That means the opera's over. So, yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. So and, and, and the way they film those scenes is really good because it's like filmed with a different type of camera. It's mm-hmm. like a sports camera. Yeah, so it's like it, super high frame rate and stuff. It feels different. It has a different look and all that. It's, and but it's funny they begin it. They're like like out of a hundred scientists surveyed. It's like Family Feud. <laughs> I think you pointed that. You said that in the notes. Um, but there's something about this, and I can't believe we missed it in the pilot. Mm-hmm. But this episode ha- may have the high water mark of sliders. Okay. All right. All right. The video max. Um, the rap video oh my god and we have to talk about it from the, the pilot too oh my god so there's two rap music videos in this show i wish there were more that's a theme that really should have continued throughout the 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 show but uh mm-hmm. in the pilot there's a communist rap music video that you only see like two seconds of and it's pretty funny yeah but it's quite comrade short. comrade get on down get that grain right into town <laughs> serve the state and its people because the individual Individual wool is evil. And they're like, this is prime time. It's like, <laughs> oh my God. Fantastic. But Beautiful. You describe the one from this one's even better. This one's like 10 times better than that. Same principle where it's a rap video about something ridiculous. This one, it's it's the library rap. It's these guys. They're going to the library because they're going to read. And it's, it, you know, it's <laughs> these shot. hardcore gangsters are going to read. <laughs> and it's shot like, you know, a, a typical 90s music video would be with cameras moving around and quick cuts and stuff. But it's all about like, <laughs> I got to read my Keats. And oh, my God. Oh, my God. I can't even. 
even go re- look it up. I'm sure it's just, on YouTube. Yeah, just it watch is it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh my goodness. And like the, the characters just can't stop laughing as they're watching it. <laughs> Rembrandt's just so disappointed in the music yeah. of this world. But you know what he's not disappointed in? This is a tiny nip, not a nitpick, but it's funny. The size of that beer uh, <laughs> picture they have when they're like watching it. <laughs> Arturo's a big boy. He needs <laughs> he needs a lot of beer. I mean, it looks drunk. like it's about three gallons is in there. <laughs> maybe that's a nineties thing. Who knows? You know, maybe it used to be that way. Price inflation, who can say? But uh, if only Bob Dole had won in '96, yeah, God rest his soul. That's a that that's a Sliders episode for you, yeah. Um, uh. But um, <laughs> they so also so like Quinn has to play this game, and he's getting threatened by these gangsters who yeah. like quote Latin, and he owes him gambling debts. And then after he talks to the gangsters, because again he owes money to the mafia, like a lot of money, a lot of money. And um, the the FBI is is talking to Quinn, I guess, because he's involved in organized crime, and it's implied he might have been fixing games. Yeah, point shaving. Point shaving. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, he's talking to the FBI, and the FBI guy in this episode, I'm pretty sure he screws up his line. Quinn is like, "Come on, man, just do me a favor," and he says. Uh, He says, we're the FBI. We're not in the favor of doing business (laughs) instead of we're not in the business of doing favors. And it's like, come on, man. That is an easy... Okay, cut, reshoot the scene. Or or just ADR it in. Just record him saying the correct line and no one... Maybe someone will say, that sounded kind of weird, but you know. We're in the favor of doing business. We're in the favor of doing business. What the hell? What the devil, I should say. Yeah, that's what Arturo likes to say that. What, what the, the devil? But um, so <laughs> at the end of the day, they defeat the mafia and Quinn wins the mind game game. Yeah. They're, they like want him to, to throw the game, but he doesn't. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's funny. He, the coach talks about how you're one of the best mind game players ever. Just like Sagan and Hawking. <laughs> I guess he didn't have ALS. I guess he didn't. Yeah. Not in this world. Sagan. Also, Carl Sagan. Very smart man. Does not. You know, if you look at him, not really an athlete. Not not an athlete, no. And because here's the thing, Jerry O'Connell looks like an athlete. Like he does. He's a, he's a tall, muscular guy. He looks like an actor. You, you know what? Actually, they mention in the show, he says, oh, I played football and I hurt my knee. Oh, of course. But then they don't talk about the fact that his knee hurts when he's like, you know, doing jump shots and stuff. And Axe, continuity. Continuity, please. come on. Please, come on. Um, so, Torme. This is actually one of the best episodes, I think, actually, because it's, it's actually one of the things that sometimes it's the episodes that aren't as big and broad in scope are actually better mm. because they focus more narrowly in on the characters and on the world and they make more sense. Yeah, I mean, what's the state? There are none. Not really. Not for the broader world, there isn't. Yeah, no, no. I don't think anybody gets like kidnapped. They get threatened by the mafia. They get threatened by the mafia, but they could just hide. But Quinn's like, hmm. no, that'd be a disappointment to all the kids out there who look up to me or yeah. some. No, they don't look like up to that. you. They look up to your double. Oh yeah, and then Arturo, he has like a, a wife or something that mm-hmm. died in real life, mm-hmm. died on Earth Prime, but is still alive here. And he gets some character stuff. He becomes not as much of a, a jerk. It softens his edge, yeah. yeah. And he's yeah. like the real team leader, especially in the first season. Like, he's the team dad. Yeah, and that experience might change him into a better person mm-hmm. that maybe uh, doesn't go down the path some certain other Arturos may go down later. We'll, exactly. we'll see later. Um, but yeah, pretty good episode. I liked it. Yeah. And then the next one, The Weaker Sex. This is a good one. Yes. Yeah, I like that one a lot. <laughs> it's like they, they, they slide into a park. No one notices them, as usual. Mm-hmm. And uh, Arturo wants to have a pretzel, and they have almost no money left. But he's like, <laughs> he wants that fucking pretzel. <laughs> you can assess a lot about a society from its food or something <laughs> silly like that. Um, I like from the, the pilot, he wants to get a kielbasa. And they're like, Professor, how can you eat at a time like this? He's like, my stomach has no political preferences. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, but yeah, they go to this pretzel stand and, and they're eating pretzels. And the guy running it says, hey, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you want to watch it, but the president's about to make an announcement. And they say, wait, President Clinton, right? Because they're hoping to get back home. They're always trying to get back home. So, you know, Clinton was president, I guess, when they left. So yeah, I think it's 94 or 95. Yeah. Yeah. So they turn the TV on. And who is it? <laughs> Hillary. Hillary Clinton. Oh, no, an ominous music starts playing. <laughs> <laughs> the like, oh no, music starts playing. Oh my Hilarious. God. 
And uh, um, and this turns out to be a world where gender roles are reversed. Yeah. Where yeah. well, mostly reversed. Mostly reversed. Because they mentioned that oh, men are so aggressive and they have so much testosterone. That's why they have to be basically disenfranchised. Yeah. Uh, so basically, the gender roles are swapped. More or less. Yeah. More or less. Yeah. yeah. And Quinn gets hired, but he's like a secretary because he's like eye candy. Because he's attractive. Yeah. And then Wade gets a big job because, and she's like, you know, finally I'm appreciated. And Rembrandt gets picked up by this like. <laughs> This lady who's a... Like Who claims a, to be a record producer. With her, but, who's uh, really like a, you know, she's just sleeping around with people. And a then, man-eater. Yeah, man-eater. Yeah, yeah. man-eater, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then you have, and then like there's a funny scene where like her old boyfriend comes and he's like, I'm telling you, like we have this, such this connection. It's like really funny. And he's like, what? You know, our, we've just been hurt by her so much, you know. So, um, and then you get... um. Arturo but, tries to like pick up the mayor and that fails. So then he decides to run for mayor. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. This is hot. This is very goofy, but a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I really, really love <laughs> the central plot of this episode is so ridiculous. He's running on a platform of men's rights, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he doesn't really take any positions. He's like, I oppose all bad things in life and I'm in favor of all good things. Way to take a position. <laughs> And during the campaign, they very rightly point out this Arturo claims to be a professor, but there's no record of him at any universities. Yeah, <laughs> which should happen more often. Yeah. Apparently, um, this is a world where none of their doubles exist. Yeah. So, you know, that clears up that plot point. But a very valid point. Arturo, what's your social security number? <laughs> or what's your address? Where yeah. do you teach? Oh, University of California. No problem. We'll just call him up and see him if you are a professor of cosmology and ontology at the, you know. <laughs> Which, by the way, cosmology and ontology, and yet he seems to be an expert about everything. Yeah, he he he, fix, he builds an atom bomb. Well, I guess a physicist. But, like, yeah. that takes practical application and skill, not just, like, theoretical. And he knows a lot about history, too. He does. Uh, he creates penicillin. But he also yeah. says, he's like, this is what you do when you don't have the maths for real science. It's like, you just created penicillin in, like, an hour. <laughs> Screw you, Louis Pasteur. Yeah, and fuck no, you. No one else, apparently, is able to do it, or almost no one else just just government scientists can but um oh and this raises a point where we're kind of off topic is that there's a couple things that they never explain which is we should have talked about this in fever but like why don't they get sick more often is it going to different worlds that's right like they should like for instance in fever uh wade gets sick and actually they all get sick and they get sick immediately they start turning yellow and their eyes turn red and stuff because that's a symptom of the cue but they're like, why are we getting so sick? And Quinn's double is like, well, different worlds, different immunities. You guys don't have a defense against it like we do. And it's like, hmm, that's a good point. But it never comes up again. Yeah, they know? never raise that point again, which is a good one. I mean, you could do a plot in the opposite direction where they go to a world and one of them has the common cold. And then the, it's a plague which shuts down the entire planet because of this thing that doesn't really affect them very much. Yeah, and then the other big one is money. Yeah. How do they go to these different worlds? Because sometimes the money is different. There's one world where it's purple, one where it's like multicolored and red. Like what happens if they hand over a dollar bill and someone's like, who the hell is this on the front of this? Who's this? Oh, this is Andrew Jackson. Who's Andrew Jackson? (laughs) You know, or something like that. Even with real money, people will look at you sideways. Sometimes you give them a $2 bill, you give them a dollar coin. These American currencies, which are legal tender that people just aren't used to, a lot of times they'll think it's counterfeit or they'll think it's a different countries. Mm -hmm. So... You know, you can't use credit cards. You can't use credit cards. What do they use for ID when they get arrested? They're like, this doesn't look like a driver's license here. Like, it's a different color. Like, what the? But then again, it's not illegal not to have a driver's license. At least it's not illegal yet. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. But like, um, and, you know, it was the 90s. So not everyone had a social security number yet. Mm-hmm. You're, you weren't assigned them at birth until when? It was the late 80s. But there were a lot of people who were adults who wouldn't have gotten them until they were older. So maybe they had a job and they were grandfathered in or something. I, I don't know. So, I mean, it's not totally ridiculous. You know, it'd be funny. They pay for stuff with money sometimes. It'd be funny if like they showed, okay, here's a bunch of different types of money we've oh. gotten from worlds. Oh, my God. Dude. And it's like, okay, they use red money here. This will probably work. Let's try this out. Because like you hand somebody cash. Maybe they don't look at it super close. You know, I've done this a million times. All I care is here's a one, here's a five, here's a 10. And, you know, I I don't really care that Hillary Clinton is on the $20 bill, you know, (laughs) like Pluto Nash. So um, 
oh, here are the, the coins are triangles. Here's some triangular coins. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully that'll work. So. Yeah, no, but I, I guess they have to hand wave that around because what's the point is, is like they have to get from world to world and. And sometimes, you know, they make little references like they'll say, like, oh, thank goodness for the professor's watch or we would have been washing dishes for a week mm-hmm. or um, or they get jobs sometimes. There's that one episode where they're day laborers. Yeah. So they work ice cream. There's one where they're ice, they're serving ice cream at the very end. The Rembrandt. Oh, yeah. Famous, famous Rembrandt one. <laughs> that um, one's awesome. Um, so you have. So yeah, the weaker sex, and he runs for mayor, the professor, mm-hmm. and he ends up winning, but he doesn't, He they slide before they find out that he wins. Yeah, it's said that like, if I win, I'll probably stay here, because that's paradise for him, to be a politician that's beloved by men everywhere, and... <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't get to live in his paradise. He keeps sliding yeah. at the end of that. It's and a, he, it's he a, wins by crying on camera too. He pulls an Edmund Muskie, but it actually works instead of like causing his support to crater. It like helps his support because <laughs> people see him as like sensitive and in touch with his feelings. Yeah. Social norms are different in this world. Yeah. He should have taken advice from the crying man himself, Rembrandt, mm. you know? Cry like a man. Cry like oh, a we, man. Oh, we forgot to mention that video at the end of the pilot. Oh, my God. Yeah, they do a little music video of Rembrandt's uh, <laughs> performance with the spinning tops, I guess, in the 70s or yeah. something. Mm-hmm. It's hysterical. <laughs> so good. He's like in this ridiculous, like, fake afro. and um, <laughs> It looks pretty cheap and silly. It does not look real. Not really. But it is very funny. It is very funny. So... Next episode. So we go to The King is Back. This is one where, very narrow focus, Rembrandt turns out to, instead of being a marginally successful singer, he's mm-hmm. like this world's version of Elvis, the Beals, everything looped into one. He, he's beloved. Like the moment yeah. they're walking down the street, people are staring at him and pointing at him and saying, oh my God, it's him. Uh, mm-hmm. Which, though, it, they also established that in this world, there's Rembrandt impersonators. So the fact that somebody looks like Rembrandt shouldn't be a surprise, but... But it's the beginning of the episode and you don't know that yet. Yeah. There's a lot of humor in, in this. And it's all about him. Like, he's like, should I stay? Should I leave with them? You know, this is paradise. Because his double supposedly died in a fishing accident. Sponge fishing. Sponge fishing. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's favorite pastime. And yeah, how do you do that? Makes me wonder. Yeah. <laughs> I well, don't know. He didn't actually die. You find that out later. Yeah, yeah. It's revealed that Rembrandt was so popular that he got tired of the fame and he wanted to go into hiding so that people would stop bothering him. Once Prime Rembrandt shows up and starts taking his place, he takes offense and he comes back into the business, sort of. And we'll explain how. But yeah, so he it's funny that people think that Arturo is Pavarotti. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that Quinn is Jim Morrison. <laughs> but it, there's just some funny moments in this. Like one of the spinning tops kidnaps Rembrandt and the guy is basically like Little Richard if he was a serial killer. <laughs> like, Woo! You know, it's just, it's so like, you know, he's going to like, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's totally absurd. Maurice, that's his name. Maurice. Yeah, because the spinning tops are failures in this world. So there's this running joke that Rembrandt is not that popular in his home universe. His his big break for that year is, is singing the national anthem at a Giants game. You know, mm-hmm. that's yeah. not that great. But the spinning tops got a bunch of gold records or whatever. But in this world, it's the opposite. Their failure, he is the... The, the king. The king know. himself. So yeah. he decides to stay. He's like, I want to enjoy. This is what I've always wanted. His agent has set up this gigantic concert, and it turns out his double comes, and he's like, well, I'm wishing him good luck. And they're like, wow, you're turning this down, even though he's getting paid a million bucks a song. He's like, a million bucks a song? I'm back. <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. back, baby. <laughs> Interrupts the performance. Yeah, yeah. And it's important, His bro- his uh, uh, the actor... Uh, what's his name again? Clinton Derricks Carroll, who is Clavant Derricks' twin brother in real life. And they look identical, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, they look very identical. Yeah, yeah. They they use them, so they don't have to use CGI to, to duplicate the scene. So long story short is he takes over, and then so Rembrandt leaves. Yeah, Rembrandt leaves with everybody else. But mm-hmm. the, a very fun episode. Also, one thing I know you wanted to talk about is that at the beginning of this episode, there is a courtroom. Oh my God! Yes, yes. So at the beginning of the the like cold open is you have Quinn's in trial and they're like your your defense you're you're from another world that's crazy and it turns out like you know he's been convicted by a jury of graffitiing an underpass pursuant to the Instant Justice Initiative you now have been sentenced to death. Um, and he's like what? And then and then his lawyer has he has two appeals and his lawyer appeals to the trial court judge and is like I appeal blah blah for whatever. 
reason. And they're both denied. And she's like, well, that's it. You're going to be executed now. And he's like, what? And <laughs> the appeals take two seconds, basically. Yeah. And um, and the judge looks a lot like Lance Ito from from the from the, from the uh, OJ trial, from the OJ trial. Yeah. But they open the portal in there and they scare everybody and they slide out. So they barely escaped. Once again, sliding in front of everybody. Here's the thing, though, is that I guess the hint is that people in California got tired of crime. So they passed a law that made basically everything punishable by death. And you have only two appeals and they're like instantaneous after your trial. See, this does not understand what's called the Eighth Amendment, which <laughs> prohibits such things. There's a reason why appeals and death penalty cases take years, if not decades. Well, there's an explanation. Some sliders came in, wrote the Bill of Rights, and then slid out, and they forgot about the Eighth Amendment. So that's that's there the reason. Go. And guess what? Through a citizen's initiative, you can't overwrite the Eighth Amendment. So. What is an initiative exactly? It's just where people vote directly on a law or constitutional amendment to be placed into the law rather than going through the legislature. Interesting. A lot of states have them. California is the most notorious. Hmm. Propositions. Oh, I get you. Like Proposition 8, the gay marriage thing. Like People can directly put something into law or the Constitution through a vote of the populace rather than going to. Interesting. Through the legislature. But... uh... And why was Quinn spray painting a highway overpass? I think it was a double of his. Oh, gotcha. All right. Oh, yeah. He's denying it. Yeah. It wasn't me, you know. It, in, it was me from a gran- different dimension. Granted, if you tried that in real life, that defense. If you tried that in real life, it might help with an insanity plea. Yeah, the lady's like, you should try an insanity defense. So yeah, so that is a good episode. The last episode of the first season, Luck of the Draw. This one's great. I, I think this one's a really good it's episode. It's a very strong episode. They slide into a public park. Once again, no one mentioned. No one notices. I think it's a, an alleyway. It's something. It's, it's out, They're always out of view of people. Right. Or no one notices. But yeah, they, they show up in this version of San Francisco, and it seems really, really nice. It's like paradise. Yeah, it's paradise. All the prices are super low. Like a, there's no crime. There's no crime. There's no taxis. You just have free cars you can use. There's no congestion. There's not really that many people. And it just seems like such a great place. And they have these like ATM machines basically mm-hmm. where, and and this should really send up some red flags immediately, mm-hmm. but you play the lottery and you get money <laughs> from playing the lottery, which really, come on. And the more money you take, the more chances you have to win. Which... Use your brain here, people. <laughs> There's something else on the other side of this. Maybe this lottery does not give you something good mm-hmm. as, as a result. So like they go up and ask. Some of them ask for like $5. Some of them ask for like 10000 And um, in this world, it turns out, is applied the principles of Thomas Malthus, who is, there was an economist in Britain in the 1800s who had this idea that the world's population would always grow faster than... Um, the food supply. So there would be forever a crime and famine and stuff like that. Well, in this world, they like took it really seriously. So this is like birth control world. There's birth control cola. That's like something they see. <laughs> that's right. Know? That's right. So yeah. like they're huge on birth control of all forms. So mm-hmm. the population of the world is 500 million, which is one tenth at the time it was one tenth. Now that's even less than one tenth mm-hmm. of what the world of the world. And they said San Francisco has less than like a hundred thousand people in it. Uh, are you familiar with the Georgia Guidestones? No. Okay. Basically, some anonymous donor put up this monument, and it has these things that the donor thought were good ideas, and one of them is that we should reduce population to some odd number. And because this weirdo did that, there's a lot of conspiracy people that think, oh, the Illuminati did this, the, the New World Order did this. Uh, no. But it just kind of reminded me of that. Yeah. 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 No. It was just someone with some, I mean, and the thing is, is that, so it turns out that this lottery that you, when you win the lottery, it's population control. They give you like $3 million and then they, they kill you, but like painlessly, or you go and you take some sort of poison that's painless and you just go to sleep and die and your, your beneficiaries get all this money. And you get basically get to do whatever you want until they kill you. For like a period of like three or four days. You have the white card. That's what it's called, the white card privileges. So you can go anywhere. Like if you go into a high-end store and say, I want to buy your most expensive diamond ring, they have to give it to you. Or like if somebody has been accused of a crime, you can keep them safe until you die. After which, you know, then then they get prosecuted or whatever. So, you know, a lot of leeway is given with this. And I'll give the episode some credit because they take quite some time before they give away the twist that, oh, Mm -hmm. it's population control. Oh, you die when you win the lottery. It's only when Quinn runs into some (laughs) right-to-lifers. Right-to-lifers, yeah. They give them, like, pamphlets about Mm -hmm. how... This is bad and this is evil. And the lottery stuff. has killed 50,000 people or something like that. And is it year, like a year? A year or something like it's that. It's crazy. But they, and it's interesting, and this is where some t- where Slider shines in some ways is that in, 
I'm not saying I agree with this, but I'm saying is that he, there's a really interesting conversation between the professor and Quinn, and he's like, this is barbaric. And the professor goes, in some ways, it's kinder than what we do. And he's like, what do you mean, professor? They kill these people. They're going to kill. And of course, Wade wins the lottery. That's why this is all happening. Right. Why they're dragged into it is Wade wins the lottery. And the professor is like, well, in our world, um, we have overpopulation and famine and millions of people die every year because of war and disease and all that. But in this world, if you don't play the lottery, you, you can't be killed. Like mm-hmm. only the people who play the lottery. So like everyone who does it knows it. People here are not scared of death. Their beneficiaries are rewarded handsomely. They get to enjoy the last few days and buy all these things and stuff like that. Well, not everyone is not afraid of death because another interesting character thing is that one of the guys who's running the lottery Mm -hmm. says, I'm a total hypocrite because I would never do this. This terrifies me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's kind of interesting. And Rembrandt, he falls in love with one of the uh, lottery winners and she's totally fine with it. She has no fear and she's completely okay with accepting the consequences of this of this act. So it's kind of an interesting look into a different world with different social norms. Yeah. It's called making way or something. I think is how they explain it. Yeah. This is a world where people are, although you made a good point in the the notes is that I think a lot more people would be freaked out once it happened. Like, Oh shit, like I'm going (laughs) to die. Oh no. Yeah. Um, I didn't think this would actually happen. Yeah. I I thought I was just going to get, you know, five, I needed 5,000 bucks. So, you know, 500,000 out of 500 million per year or something Mm -hmm. like that. Like, Oh no, you know, what are the chances? But Yeah, but a really good episode. And it would be so easy, like when they're taking money from that ATM to like have like, you know, ominous music. Oh, no, they're doing something bad. But they they have the the discipline to not do that. And I think that's great. So it ends up they rescue Wade and she's fallen in love with this guy, Ryan, who's also a lottery winner. And Rembrandt tries to bring this lady with him and she turns him into the police, the lottery police. Lottery police. Remember, and they, yeah. you have the right to remain silent and it will be used against you in court. <laughs> what a what a great... Uh, what a funny inversion of, of the Miranda rights, yeah. And they say like those who mess with the lottery die painful deaths. Like they, they make it sound like you get tortured to death yeah. by the state. So even in this beautiful beautiful world that's like almost his paradise there's always a dark side to at least some of it yeah and it's like oh we'll torture you to death if you try to interfere with the system it's like oh my god you're gonna go get processed yeah you go to the municipal like you're going to the municipal processing center where your death will be very very painful it's like <laughs> why not just kill them like why don't you just shoot them why are you gonna torture them? i mean what's the point well to a certain extent i guess executions somewhat serve a purpose of showing society that this is unacceptable this action was so heinous that the state must step in and intervene and and think of all the money the state lost by all these white colored privileges (laughs) that's the reason i'm really a right to lifer is the money aspect oh no i want more money (laughs) we're giving all these lottery people money to stimulate the economy why not me exactly (laughs) so at the end of the day, they rescue him. Ryan helps save Wade and police as they're getting away. He comes with them, Ryan. And then one of the police officers shoots Quinn as he's going into the vortex. And that's the end of Quinn. It's the Ryan show from now <laughs> yeah, on, right? Just... <laughs> no, not quite. That would have been, yeah, what an ending that would have been. <laughs> Which I guess they could have done that. Jerry O'Connell could have said, no, nah, I don't want to do season two. Yeah. And it'd be very different after that. It would be. But we go to season two, episode one, Into the Mystic. Oh. Oh, no. Max, you have a lot to say about this. I'm going to let you lead on this one. Okay, okay. So you, you start off where the previous episode left off. They're in this new world. Quinn is there, and Quinn is very distressed because they're about to slide out. Quinn's about to die, and everyone's laughing at him. Oh, no, it's a dream sequence. It's fine. Basically... What's that guy's name? Richard or whatever? Like the the Ryan? Ryan. Yeah, Ryan, he leaves. No real explanation. He's a doctor, I guess. He he, he takes the bullet out of his shoulder. Yeah, takes the bullet out of Quinn's shoulder. They're there for several days, so Quinn gets some time to heal. Some time, but not, he's not fully healed yet. And then they just slide into this next world, and what a world it is. Oh. God. Oh my God! This is uh this is the first warning bells <laughs> in yes. this show. That's yeah. like, oh no! <laughs> they go to a world where it appears that magic is real. So there's like witch doctors are are the doctors in this world. Mm-hmm. 
bill collectors are demons, quote unquote. They're grim reapers. Grim reapers. There you go. Yeah. Oh my God. There's fortune tellers. It's it's just totally ridiculous. It's like Halloween world. Halloween world, basically. You know, it's like a bad episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer or whatever. It's just, <laughs> oh my God. Why, what caused the world to be like so interested in all these? It's the Golden Gargoyle Gate Bridge. Oh no. What oh. caused the world to be this way yeah what's the point of divergence which led to this <laughs> how did we get here <laughs> <laughs> they mentioned that edward jr was the president at one point yeah some some character stole his brain or something <laughs> and that they want to steal quinn's brain i cannot remember why but they do oh because see they run out on a medical bill and the doctor's like i'm putting a lien on you <laughs> and i want a body part and i want your brain <laughs> oh that's right yeah yeah very goofy. Very goofy. And uh, one of the important things is that there's a, the sorcerer, quote unquote, yeah. that's like the the ruler of this weirdo magic town, magic country. It's not clear <laughs> where the Halloween begins and ends <laughs> in this world. It's so stupid. Because oh, the, the sorcerer mentions that I was talking to someone from Japan recently. Yeah. Is Japan spooky Halloween world I, uh, too? I don't know. There's one character that talks about the separation between coven and state, which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it shows a weakness of the show is that oftentimes it's America centric or even San Francisco centric. Like they don't really think about the, the rest of the world yeah. when they make these. Yeah, how else is spooky Halloween town? What happened in history that made everyone like obsessed with the occult? But there's still like lawyers. They go and like see a lawyer. And he's like, well, there's not much I can do. You've got a bill collector after you. Oh, and like in the gender roles or reversed world, there's a female pope and all sorts Jane of... Jane Pauly. <laughs> Jane Pauly II. Yeah. So like, I don't know. Once again. Yeah. So spooky Halloween town and they have to be on the run from these bill collectors and the sorcerer turns out to be a double of Quinn. Um, he, they talk about the sorcerer steak sauce at one point or something like that. He's just using this as like a business opportunity. <laughs> Though I have to commend the episode for not having magic be real on this world. I agree with you. I commend them that they did not make magic real. Yeah. Although there's some things like the fortune teller seems to know a lot of stuff. So maybe magic is real. Who knows? But the fortune teller's fortune is so vague that the, Arturo even points out, I'm sure this would apply to, to most people in most scenarios, the stuff that they're mm -hmm. saying. So yeah. good good job in that, in that respect. Exactly. So, but at the end of it, the sorcerer who can control sliding, I guess, he resets their timer and is going to send them home to their coordinates. But they get to home and they have 17 seconds or something like that. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And Quinn, he's going to test to see if it's home. So he says, oh, my, the fence creaks, every, the gate creaks every time I open it. And it doesn't creak. So they leave. Yeah. But then these people, his mom comes out into the gardener and he's just oiled it. And it turns out that I guess it actually is their world. But here's the thing is this actually raises a tough point, which is how would they ever know that they're really back? Because they could land in a world, and we'll address this later on in the second season, you could land in a world that is so similar that you almost couldn't tell the difference. They should just have like a checklist of things to check. Ask someone, what year is it? Who's the president? What state is it? And then also like work out what's an acceptable world and what isn't an acceptable world if they get separated. Okay, we're not home, but would it be okay if we had to stay here? Yeah, you know, yeah. Is this close enough? Yeah. What's what's your uh, yeah? What's your threshold? Is Halloween Town enough or <laughs> Halloween Town unacceptable? Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, World made of fire. No. <laughs> oh yeah, we're gonna talk about that one. Oh my god. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that that would be pretty funny. Um, so. So you have that. But so then you go on to the next episode, which is Love Gods. Love Gods, an episode that I did not watch all of. I watched, I've watched it. So long story short is the Iraqis unleash some sort of biological weapon during the Gulf War that kills most of the men in the world. So it's basically run by women. Oh, biological or chemical. It's not clear. I think Something. they say both at one point. They say poison and they say disease. Some Whatever. sort of a weapon mm -hmm. that kills most of the men in the world. And there's like... There's like a thousand men left in the United States and there's no in vitro fertilization in this world. So they have to make, they have to rebuild their population the good old fashioned way, but putting men in camps where they have sex seven times a day with women to try and get them pregnant. No birth control here. This is not birth control world. And one wonders, why would Iraq do this? 
what is chemical Ali? Like, I want to die. <laughs> I want to kill myself and all men in Iraq in order to maybe kill people in America. Yeah, I don't know. But either way, so Australia is like the world superpower yeah. and America's in a race to repopulate and they get captured because they're men and put in these camps and blah, blah, blah. And they escape. And, hmm. and like one of the ways like the women police are trying to track them down is they go to a house they're hiding out and they see the toilet seat is up. So oh. There must be men in here. Oh, God. <laughs> You'd think they'd redesign the toilet at that point. Exactly. But it is funny to see the world hasn't changed. There's still jurisdictional fights between the FBI and mm. local police. It is funny, though, that the women are so desperate for men is that the Australians at one point capture Arturo. And you, and John Rhys Davies is a heavier gentleman, and he's not exactly like grade A prime cut. But it's funny, like this, uh, this Australian soldier locks herself in the room with him and starts undressing. And it's like really funny. <laughs> This was in his contract. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> I yes. need to have a lap dance on camera, please. <laughs> There's no lap dance. She's just this like attract this lady. She starts like unbuttoning her uniform and all that, and he's just like, huh. And then a lady basically, <laughs> it's hinted, guilt trips Quinn into like sleeping with her to give her a son uh, or a child uh, to care for, what whatever. An and they also escape with some other people by driving a van straight into the wormhole, which what? makes no sense. Wait a second. They've already established that they don't bring lots of people through the wormhole because it could for some reason, kill them all, maybe, yeah. possibly. Well, they don't. Not in this episode, though. Not in this episode. Because uh, that's a question is like, why don't they just bring more people through? Oh, this person's uh, uh, being hunted by the government. Well, just jump with us and maybe you'll be fine. They do that all one. the day. They, yeah, they do that. There's like a stretch here in the second season where that happens. Okay, okay. But um, so the next the next one is Jillian of the Spirits. Yeah, I actually ended up... I, I I skipped it temporarily and I came back and I watched the rest of it. And eh, this one's okay. This one's fine. An interesting divergence in this world. One that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, though. So in this world, they said they carefully studied the effects of Hiroshima and decided technology was the devil's work. Technology is banned because of Hiroshima. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> <sighs> that really does not make a ton of sense. So there's horses everywhere. There's like 1950s well, it, cars. Technology is frozen. Frozen. So further development of technology. But they already let the nuclear genie out of the bottle. So 1940s technology was good enough to make the nuclear bomb. So like the fact that it's frozen there doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense. So yes. So technology being frozen at 1940s levels, just not. And there appears to be some sort of. It, they talk about there have been some like incremental changes, so it's more like early to mid fifties technology when they're there in nineteen ninety five or yeah. ninety six or whatever year it is. I mean, they have soldering irons, so there's some kind of technology advancement. There's no TV, hmm. but there are radios, and there's like a funny time where they're like in the lobby of the hotel and um the one that's run by will sasso yeah he's back again yeah and there's the bureau of anti-technology that's what you have to look out for um but um there's a, a, a beauty pageant and it's on the radio uh. which is funny um <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> uh and part of the gimmick of this episode is that quinn lightning struck the portal when quinn went through it so obviously, as you know, if lightning hits the portal, when you go through it, you become invisible and intangible. Obviously. Obviously. Hard science this yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, no one can see or hear him. Right. Well, except for Jillian of the spirits. <laughs> Who's this, yeah, girl, local girl who they run into who can hear and see him. Why? Don't know. <laughs> Hand wave. Hand wave. <laughs> Don't care. Doesn't horses, matter. Horses can see him also. Yes, for some reason. Why? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> but either way, and they, they need to fix the... T of course, the timer's also been damaged by this lightning strike, and but there's no Quinn to fix it, and it's a te technologically backwards world. And Yeah, and the supporting characters have to figure it out. And Jillian of the Spirits helps. is helping them. Mm -hmm. uh, Quinn can like spy on people and stuff because he's invisible. Yeah. There's a, a, there's a Star Trek The Next Generation episode that's kind of like this, where they're like running through walls and stuff. It's actually a pretty good one. This one's not bad, but yeah. it is. It's it, it's kind of a strange divert. It's just not very realistic. If you could call anything on this show realistic, <laughs> um, but long story short, is they they eventually figure it out, and he can slide through the portal. Goes through the the astral plane he struck on, so he can slide out, and he rejoins them. Okay, all right. 
But um, the Bureau of Anti-Technology, that's it's goofy. And why would you do that? And also the biggest quote, well, there's a couple things. One is they're walking by and it said Spartacus, number one movie in the country for the 1,872nd week in a row. And it's like, <laughs> why? Because technology is behind. You know, they had movies before Hiroshima, right? Yeah. Like, why would this one movie be the most popular movie for 36 years? I looked it up. Spartacus came out in 1960. And this came out, I guess this is 95, or may, maybe is this 96? Yeah, 36 years. Why the hell would it be that popular for 36 years? Also, just spitballing here, movies are popular. You know, it'd be great if you could watch movies in your home with some sort of piece of technology or something. Why is that wrong? No, we'll just keep on going to the... Just keep on going to the movie theater. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Even home projectors. I mean, come on, something. Yeah. Either way. There we go. Good old Jillian of the Spirits. Jillian of the Spirits. Next. Next episode. El Cid. El Cid with an S, not a C. Yes. Yeah, there's a El Cid in real life with a C. Yes, not that. Not that guy. This one's fun. It starts mm-hmm. off with an apocalyptic wasteland. People are shooting at automatic guns and dune buggies are driving around. It's mm-hmm. like Mad Max. Uh, not clear what the divergence is in this world. Some sort of general collapse of the American society, some sort of civil war. Mm-hmm. But there's like this jerk guy who's named Sid. Mm-hmm. He seems to be some sort of criminal and he's abusive to this woman. He's like hitting her and yelling at her and stuff. And Quinn. Michelle. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and Quinn, Quinn just has to step in because he's a good guy. He's a hero. He has to step in to help people. Mm-hmm. He like punches out Sid. He's like, follow me, Michelle. We'll go through this portal and we'll drop you off in the next world that we go to. Oh, how nice of them. We'll just drop you off wherever we put we land. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're in spider wasp world. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. <laughs> but yeah, but Sid, who's played by Jeffrey Dean Morgan, mm-hmm. who's later in Supernatural and um, The Walking Dead, and he's been in Watchmen and a whole bunch of things. Yeah, he's Negan from The Walking Dead. And when I saw him, I thought, man, this guy really reminds me of Negan. No idea that he was actually that guy. Yeah. And he, he's like the same character. He's got a leather jacket. He's got a bad attitude. He's like just a jerk. Yeah. Uh, so, but guess what? He follows them through the portal. <laughs> which no one else has ever thought of doing until yes. now. Yeah. <laughs> you'd think that you'd have one guy wait till the last second to like push people back from trying to follow them. Yeah. Every time. But no. But he follows them. So the timer takes six people and they land in. Well, how would you describe the world they land in, Max? It's it's a little unclear what's going on. At, at first, it kind of seems like the demolition man world because it's it's strictly regimented and they talk about needing to go to group therapy. Uh, there's government housing everywhere. There's earthquakes that are happening pretty regularly and some bad CGI attacks the city. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Everything's very blurry. <laughs> <laughs> animated gifs are exploding across the screen <laughs> but it you know it just seems like kind of your run-of-the-mill sort of uh dystopia mild mm-hmm. dystopia yeah but then the reveal happens this is prison san francisco national penitentiary <laughs> and it turns out that they think there's a giant earthquake's going to come and drop san francisco into the, the ocean so they're like but why don't we just make it a prison and put all our undesirables there so they die when... <laughs> when. <laughs> but it makes you wonder, who would be a prison guard in this world? Yeah. Well, how do they enforce that? Yeah. yeah. Maybe the prison guards are also prisoners. Who knows? Yeah. Who kn- yeah. But, yeah. and you, you have a buddy at the prison that you wear these weird advanced electronic bracelets. And if your buddy violates the law, they kill you too. They kill both of you. Um, <laughs> the buddy system. Yeah. yeah. So Quinn's buddy is Sid. They, they, they meet up with him. And it's kind of interesting. They kind of sort of accept, oh, well, Sid's going to be one of the, one of the boys now. Well, not sort really. Of. I think that they're, they're intending to get rid of him. That'd be funny him. just to leave him on fire world or something. <laughs> Spider wasp world. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> and Sid, you know, Sid's a jerk, so he's breaking the rules and stuff. And if you break the rules, you die and your buddy dies. So Quinn's trying to keep Sid from getting in trouble. And there's this guy who actually saw them slide in. It's one of the few times they have people who see them slide in. He also had a double who was on Sid's world. And L- like LJ. LJ. Yeah. And eventually he like betrays them and they're trying to get the timer. And these people, it's funny, they're in their storehouse full of all their valuable things, which include VHS 
players. <laughs> stacks and stacks of VHS players. Why you would need a VHS player in prison. <laughs> what VHSs are you watching here? <laughs> <laughs> Either way, is that this this world has electric cars. They even say that. So why they need VHS players is... The, the first of many times we'll see electric cars in this show. Yeah. Which are also known as golf carts. Golf carts. Yes. Very, very similar to that. But long story short is, is that then this LJ gets killed by this Michelle and then Sid betrays him to some guard and then she kills Sid and they slide out. But... Yeah. As the giant earthquake hits and everything starts shaking. Ooh. Wait, does she does she die? Does she No, slide? she slides out with them, but she okay. obviously they drop her off somewhere or whatever. But there's a couple things about this episode. One thing I like and one thing that you noted. First of all, we should go with what you noted about it showing prison cities and movie tropes and all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Usually when you do a, a prison city in fiction, it's like this dystopian hellscape. There's no law. Survival of the fittest. Escape from New York. Escape from New York. Yeah, there's like Escape no Escape from L.A. <laughs> oh, God. What a disaster that is. Oh, dear. But like... Yeah, that's not what prison is like. At least that's not what prison is like in America. Well, maybe in like South America. Yeah, there's like South American prisons, which are like crazy. They have a riot and like 300 people die. It's horrifying. (laughs) Insane. But in America, you know, prison is very regimented. You go to one place, you go to another place. There's a schedule every day. Yes, you don't exactly have freedom to do whatever you feel like. It's very orderly. So... Mm. It's kind of interesting that a prison could seem like a society at first glance, a, a, like a place you people live. But there is. Know? There's a hierarchy. There's a function to it. So it actually is a, a better imagining than most of what a prison city would look like. And they have interesting uniforms. They have like a tree logo and all this other stuff. It's hinting at things about this world that is never fleshed out later, but kind of fun. And but then I like is that it, it shows that there's consequences to their actions because often they seem to avoid the consequences or everything works out in the end from their involvement. And it's Mm -hmm. nice to see. And even like the professor one point comments, we need to talk with him about Quinn's proclivities for like getting us into trouble. It's come to like bite us in the ass. He doesn't say it exactly like that, but it has because someone has finally followed them instead of just leaving their messes behind them. Someone's like followed after them as stupid as that guy is. Because so often sliding is just a joke. It's like, see you later. Ha ha. It's nice to have consequences. Yeah. I do like that. And also, Sid gets in trouble at one point during the episode because he knocks off an ATM <laughs> and it has purple money. And he's like, the money's the wrong color. So that's funny, the money's the wrong color. Also, who the hell puts an ATM in a prison? Why do you need an ATM in a prison? Shouldn't they just be getting all their stuff for free? Why do you need money? Um, excuse me, the commissary, your soups, your uh what what's honey buns honey buns what are the chips called oh the whole shebang the whole shebang yeah yeah the chips so good you're willing to go back to prison for them <laughs> allegedly <laughs> allegedly <laughs> but you know commissary come yeah, on but they, they 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 have like credits like you don't you don't pay cash mm, right i mean i know there's prisons have you know they use various things as cigarettes cigarettes is like currency con- contraband as like contraband as currency but why would you have a place where you could get money whatever <laughs> but um your next, scotty dollars your camel cash yeah but it is funny because the money is purple and he even says that like he holds out a bunch of monopoly looking money and he's like this money's the wrong color <laughs> but a good one I, I i actually quite like this one next up the good the bad and the wealthy texas world texas world and it's it's sillier than that it's like <laughs> texas western movie world <laughs> Yeah. So it's not just that Texas rules everything. It's like... Well, Texas doesn't rule everything. Not everything. True, true, true. But it does rule San Francisco. It rules most of the Western United States. Yes. Not They're, all of it. Not like Oregon and um, Oregon, Oregon, yes. and Washington. But it's like California, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona. It looks like probably Utah, um, mm. Texas. Those are all part maybe Colorado. But, and if you look in the background of the episode, this is a great thing. He's in a a police station and there's a map and it actually has the map of the Republic of Texas in the United States. (laughs) Which, you know, that's great. I wish they did that kind of stuff more often. That'd be fun. Even even in episodes where it doesn't matter. Yeah. Just have like, oh, the Gadsden purchase didn't happen or, oh, Maine is different. Yeah. It's like we own Mexico. We own the Philippines, Canada, Mexico, Guatemala. Oh my God. S.M. Sterling world. There's another Um, S.M. Sterling world later. I uh, think. There is. Um, Uh, But so 
they slide into this world and they go to a saloon to get food. And it's weird because people are driving around in cars, but they also go into like old West saloons to eat. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, they can go to a place to get rifles and shotguns made to order, which I thought was pretty funny. But like <laughs> this guy gets into a dispute and Quinn's trying to help him. And this other guy threatens to shoot him. And then Quinn, they have like a showdown and Quinn shoots him in this thing and then they're like yeah you're the best negotiator in town now you out negotiated jack bullock's top negotiator and he's like what's that and it turns out this is there's like no lawyers on this world they're called negotiators and they're literally hired guns it's like what arturo says <laughs> practicing law is what they call it is you play cards at a table trading stocks. That's how they trade stocks. It's a, they have like <laughs> stock tickers up in these saloons, but they're like playing with like, these are my blue chip stocks. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so ridiculous. And they talk about like, oh, that guy was so good. You know, Harvard's law class of 93 could have a could have its reunion in a phone book. And I, my thought is, why would Harvard Law license people to practice law in another country and they're also like and they made a preliminary sec filing it's like and why would the sec a u.s <laughs> government organization um <laughs> exist in another country why would they exist in texas next you're going to tell me finra exists in um <laughs> in, in texas too we must abide by chevron difference here yeah in this yeah exactly yeah <laughs> yeah um it, i can't it, reveal that that's under hipaa yeah exactly yeah it's like why why <laughs> but they also show like they go in the saloon and they have a picture of George Bush, H.W. Bush up. And they're like, oh, you must have been president of, of the Republic of Texas. Well, guess what? George H.W. Bush was born in Connecticut or Massachusetts. Ooh, He's nice. born in Massachusetts. He only moved to Texas after World War II. Interesting. Um, so you know, Connecticut is where George W. Bush was born. Sorry. Got it. Okay. Um, but um, so that's these are lawyers. That's how they do. Yeah. But in the, like there's a lot of corp. There's some like this thing about this big corporation wants to hire on. Quinn, but like they're trying to take over like the lady he was trying to help. Like she has a software company and all these things about underwriting and SEC filings, and oh it gets God. really it's a very this, convoluted plot. This yeah, this episode. weird corporate espionage, and all while they take breaks from working in this like very modern skyscraper to go like out to this weird ranch to go like shoot bottles with Colt Peacemaker revolvers. <laughs> And my question is, why the hell aren't there semi-automatics in this country? Great Where's question. Where's someone's Colt 45? Why is everyone walking around with revolvers? Obviously, modern technology exists to a certain extent. They have computers. So. That's the main, the main yeah, thing is a computer right. company computers. they're fighting over. It's a microchip company. Oh, my God. You're right. You're right. I forgot about that. And it has a very annoying character, the child of this yeah, woman. And he's like, he's come here to save us. And they're like, he's a man of peace. And he's like, no, I know Quinn better than you. He's a man of violence. Mm. Like the Mighty Morphin Texas Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> Does he really say that? Well, something like that. Something they talk like about that. like the mighty Morphin Texas Rangers, which I thought was pretty funny. The end scenes like they bring in Billy the Kid. Who's I, a, I was hoping that would be Banesh, but no. It's not. It's not. But there's like a Shane-like thing at the end. The bad guy gets arrested and they slide off in front of like hundreds of people. Yeah, as usual. <laughs> yeah. Um, at one point, Quinn gets a hangover and he's like, here, have this can of prairie oyster, which is... Is that supposed to be bull semen? That's yeah. Prairie oysters are bull testicles. I don't know what I'm going to show in the episode to illustrate this. But you know, just show like a, a can of can or something. Like yeah, that. something, something. But like, uh, yeah, he likes drinking from it, and he's drinking from it. And Rembrandt kind of looks at him funny. So weird. Why would you sell that in cans? Is what I'm. How wondering. would that last? Oh my god. <laughs> would um, you, I guess you'd have to refrigerate it, right? Because it is. I, it's like milk, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I like milk. Uh, <laughs> Got milk <laughs> posters. <laughs> here's here's Stephen King with some white on his upper lip. <laughs> oh my god! Oh dear. So, um, but this is actually I like, and I'll I, at the end I want to talk about my favorite worlds or my mm -hmm. most believable worlds, and this is actually one of the top. If not the top. Okay. Uh, great. Actually, sorry. The Great Fellows one. When we talk about that, maybe the top. But whatever. Next one, I want to get to Time Again in World. Yes. Yes. The most believable world of all. J. Edgar Hoover world. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Where'd even start with this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, there's actually two worlds we see. The first one is is one where women have beards for some reason. 
isn't really explained, but, uh, <laughs> and before they slide out, there's some crime that's being committed. Yeah, there's, there's like a, a car cr- accident and then this guy shoots one of the people. Yeah. Pulls out a gun and shoots him and then yeah. they slide and the same thing is about to happen again, except. So there's some sort of weird time delay on this next universe. Yeah. So time moves ever so slightly different and women don't have beards. That's the difference between these two worlds. Yes. But yeah, they see this crime about to be committed and one of them stops it. Is it Wade? Wade. I don't know. Wade does. Okay. All right. And she, the guy whose car got hit, instead of getting shot, he shoots the person. And then the guy falls to the ground and he's wearing a skirt. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> because. <laughs> this is a world where John F. Kennedy was assassinated by Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who are circus clowns in this world. <laughs> oh, no. Um, and then for some reason, J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, becomes president and he turns the United States into a totalitarian society. And they have Arturo reads a portion of the second Gettysburg address that he gives. That's right. And he's like unveiling against democracy, the breakdown of the family unit, godless amorality. Hoover. 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 And it's funny because they don't find out like they're talking to a bar fly at some point. The guy's like, so how long have we been under martial law? Like to like the bartender. And he's like, I don't know, like 35 years or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, you know, ever since Hoover got elected and, and Arturo's like, Herbert Hoover? And he's like, no, J. Edgar, the stepfather of our country. I'm like, oh, my God, this is great. And um, they have tiny discs instead of CD-ROM. It's so bizarre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But long story short is J. Edgar Hoover turns the United States into a, into a totalitarian state, police state under martial law. But he also institutes a requirement that all police officers wear skirts. And there's a pretty funny scene where Arturo explains about the cross-dressing thing with J. Edgar Hoover and Clyde Tolson. <laughs> there's also Dragnet. There's a modern version of yeah. Dragnet, which is a show that Hoover bankrolled or did something with. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, probably. Yeah, and because the, they think it's like Scottish world at first, but it turns out. And they get involved in this thing about, like, there's the last, the fundamental constitutionalist, Judge Nassau, the guy in the card that got hit. He has the last unredacted copy of the Constitution. What? And he wants to play it on pirate radio. Oh, but my God. also, the internet exists in this world. <laughs> and that's how it ultimately gets distributed at the end, because they do this whole thing, and blah, 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 and I don't have to describe the plot. And The they, internet, yeah. uh, which is a new thing yeah. in 95, 96. But, like, why would a police state like this allow the internet to exist? Great great question. Why wouldn't another country be like, oh, yeah, we have a copy of your constitution. Here you go. Here's a good thing to destabilize the Hoover administration. Excellent point. Um, Lyndon very... LaRouche is the president. <laughs> Who's that again? He was, like, this guy who would... It's hard to describe. He has these very bizarre, had these very bizarre political beliefs, mm. um, very fringe. Oh, wait. Yeah, that's a guy who was like a communist and then he stopped being a communist or something. I don't know. Something like, something I don't know. Something weird. Yeah. Um, but it's even funnier is, is that they talk about, they're trying to figure out where this, they go to a nightclub, the drinking age is 27. Um, <laughs> they go to a store and they're like, we have all the state approved sounds here. It's Kurt Cobain's A Christmas Album. Jim Irving, sin- Jim Morrison sings Irving Berlin. <laughs> Um, Donny Osmond is like Michael Jackson. Um, he's like, that guy is really out there. Awesome. And then they go to a computer store and it's like the, there's also, if you look in the background, there's J Edgar Hoover pictures in every business, like in their hotel, it's always in the background. Props to the prop department. Excellent work. Yeah. Guys. They go to look at a J Edgar Hoover model. It's the Tolson model. The is what Tolson they call. Model. But it's got a little, it looks like the IBM logo, the old IBM logo, but it's got like J Edgar Hoover's face and that like weird metal thing. Um, it's like they they kill it, the prop people. The money is actually different colored if you look at it very carefully. But they go. talk about, they're like, oh, they ask someone about Alcatraz and like, can you go to it? And they're like, yeah, it's the second most popular tourist attraction after Hoover's tomb. <laughs> If only we could go, Max. Now that would be a sight to see. You know who's buried in Hoover's tomb? Tolson. Hoover. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that too. <laughs> They're buried together. Um, uh, um, but uh, and then and then he's like he's like so they shut down the prison. He's like, what do you mean? It's an active prison. That's where Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. are. And my thought is, why would a police state allow people to visit a maximum security prison that has famous political prisoners in it (laughs) people who could speak to the people or make hand signals or whatever Mm -hmm. Hmm. stupid interesting Um, so this episode isn't actually that the story is whatever but like it's the little stuff that makes it really funny and the j edgar hoover everyone wearing skirts is pretty funny too a a great example of like the central plot being whatever who cares Mm -hmm. but the peripheral stuff being great yeah lots of fun uh, nice. 
Next What's... episode is Indino Veritas. Indino or... Veritas. This was inevitable. It was inevitable. <laughs> Dinosaurs. Like um, like uh, Thanos, it was inevitable. <laughs> um, it um, must happen. Jurassic Park comes out. Jurassic we Park. We must make a dinosaur episode. Yes. Oh, and they did. <laughs> and they go to a world where dinosaurs never died out. But mm-hmm. human beings evolved. And not only did they invo- evolve, the United States exists as a country. China exists as a country. <laughs> um, and it's like for want of a nail, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe when you when you have your point of divergence tens of millions of years in the past at least i mean come on give they me talk about like a fredericks of hollywood catalog or san jose it's called san francisco where they're at <laughs> but it's a dinosaur preserve and there's a hungry allosaurus chasing them around mm. and oh yes i've seen it in the intro over oh and over God. and over again remember it in the in the dinosaur in the dinosaur and um, and they all come from a world where they had to wear truth collars, so they can't lie to each other, mm. and blah blah blah. And they have yeah. to escape the dinosaur in the end. Um, but <laughs> um, but the, there's like the there's a park ranger who's like following them, but the park ranger is a hologram. It's stupid. Oh no! And it talks about like the Chinese, like they ground up dinosaur sex organs for like <laughs> traditional medicine. Well, you know they do that in real life with dinosaur bones. Mm-hmm. Chinese traditional medicine does that, so. Okay. Yeah. It, <laughs> but, this was actually one of their highest rated episodes ever, apparently. Really? Yeah, because it was dinosaurs. People like dinosaurs. Love dinosaurs. People oh, like dinosaurs. It's true. People love dinosaurs. They like dinosaurs. They love dragons. <laughs> can't oh. wait to put dragons in Yeah, this the show. dragons one. Holy shit. Um, <laughs> can't wait to talk about that one. <laughs> Let's do um, dinosaurs again. It works so well the first time. They do dinosaurs twice, actually, and then they do the dragons. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> oh my God. in Dino, so the next one is post traumatic. Slide syndrome, which I know is one of your favorites, so I want you to take the lead on this one. I really quite enjoyed this episode. So it it's, has an interesting premise. They show up, seems to be the world that they're trying to get to. You know, everything seems right. I think even the gate is squeaky. No, mm-hmm. it's not squeaky. It is not squeaky. I'm pretty sure. I can't recall. But anyway, there's a lot of things that are the same, and they're like, Quinn, we're home. We're home. Time to stop sliding, but Quinn is not convinced. He still he feels like something's not quite right. He looks in like a sports almanac, and he knows he knows that some game went one way and it didn't go that way. And mm-hmm. he's like, "See, this is proof." But they're like, "I are you sure about it? You're probably just misremembering things." And it's all Quinn just kind of doubting himself and trying to find proof mm-hmm. that they're not in the right world. And then it turns out they they it comes clear when they see that there's no Golden Gate Bridge. It's the Azure Gate Bridge. Why would no one have noticed that early on? It's like the Golden Gate Bridge is blue and you didn't notice that. And they're there for like weeks. <laughs> yeah. Also, Arturo is evil, or at least he appears to be evil yeah. in this episode. He like turns on them. He claims he invented sliding. and Yeah. He's like, appears on the news and I'm a slider and I've been sliding for years. And all the other guys, other than Quinn, they take advantage of their status as sliders mm-hmm. and become celebrities. But Quinn is like this weird loner who refuses to go public. And um, it's it's pretty cool. It's well done. And the divergence is, is not that Arturo turned evil, but his double never slid on this world. Only Quinn, Wade, and Rembrandt. <laughs> yeah. um, and so because of that, he's still there. And he kidnaps their professor. And then they get into a fight. They go to free their professor. They get into a fight. And then one professor slides with them. And one the one who's left goes, oh, my God, as they leave. <laughs> and they're not sure if they have the right professor. And it turns out that Tracy Torme will later reveal, years after the show ended, that they, in fact, did not bring the right professor with him. I love which, that. And I'm sure he did it even at the time intentionally, knowing that could be a good story in a later season. Yeah. It's kind of a neat idea. So, yeah, I mean, they, they have an out there. And uh, it is funny, though, because it seems like they never really bring that up again. <laughs> the fact that they're not quite sure if this guy's the real guy. Maybe I'm wrong. There's, yeah, I don't think they, they don't really talk about it much. Mm-hmm. They try and bury the lead on it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But a, a good episode, and I love the, there's a couple different twists, and the way it's written is really good. Even though it's, like, not an interesting episode from a historical perspective, because it's almost exactly like our world, it's still pretty fun. And it brings up that point of, how can you honestly tell, especially if you've been going for years, you've been sliding, mm. how could you honestly tell the world different? If you landed in a world where the only difference is, you know, you were going to go get something from your bathroom and you forgot it and you turned, instead of turning right to go fully around, you turned left. 
How could you tell the difference? Right. I mean, yeah. there would literally be nothing different, probably. Mm-hmm. How would you be able to tell? Or how would you be if it was like some, you know, Andrew Ufendel's, you know, Monty Bounces the Ryan <laughs> world? Like, if you're not that far into military history, how are you going to tell? You know? Wait, tell me, did Constant Rebecca obey the order on... <laughs> and then people are like, who's Constant Rebecca? And they're like, oh my, oh my God. God. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Dramatic music plays. <laughs> <laughs> But a highly recommended episode. This is mm-hmm. definitely in like my top five favorite episodes of, this, sure. of the show. Next one is Obsession. A one I've seen, you haven't. I did stupid. Yeah. I watched about the first five minutes and I said, no, thank you. They land on a world where 10% of the population is psychic. And then there's this guy who's in love with Wade and blah, 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 you know, whatever. Do they explain why they're psychic? Did, are like their brains different? No, 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 no. Isaac Hayes is the chief oracle, though, which is pretty funny at one point. <laughs> that is very funny. I do um, like that. Yeah, this is one of my least favorite of the second. This is one of the weaker second season ones next to the Into the Mystic. So, But let's move on to one of my favorites. Yes. Great fellas. Great fellas. Uh, what a great episode. Do you want to describe it or you want me? Ah, you can do it. So Great Fellas is they land in a world where Prohibition never ended. And because Prohibition never ended, the mafia has built itself to unbelievable heights because they can, they've, they never had to switch to other forms of income. Mm-hmm. Um, so managed to turn San Francisco into like a gambling paradise, all the West coast or the skyline has, has neon lights all over the place. Yeah. There's casinos everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Like there's a, there's a turn, you know, like one of those, um, a slot machine, a slot machine, like in the phone book, <laughs> you know, and they get involved in this thing involving like there's these mafia families are going to marry this Jewish and Italian Finally, Fine. the Jews and Italians, mortal enemies are connected, they yes. say in the episode. And they're going to unite to combine nuclear weapons codes so they can secede California and Nevada so they can get like, gambling paradises or something like that. Seems like it's already a gambling paradise. Yeah, it does. Mm. It does. And then Quinn, they, you know, then they try and pay. It turns out Rembrandt's double is their version of like the incorrupt of the, um, the, um, the incorruptibles. It's the incorrupt. What do they call them? But they know they. Uh, oh yeah, the movie, um, the untouchables, the untouchables in yeah. real life. We call them untouchables here. They're the incorruptibles. Yeah. I wonder um, what Thomas Dewey did in this world. Hmm. I don't know. But it's interesting that this world, um, to- Ronald Reagan's running to be governor in 1996 That's in right, California. Yeah. It's like a more libertarian world. They hint that the federal government is not as powerful, mm-hmm. but they still have nuclear weapons Except about prohibition. That's still iron grip on. That. Yes. No alcohol. <laughs> They go to like a casino and they're drinking soda and yeah. water and stuff. He's like, can I have a beer? And he's like, what is this, a speakeasy? <laughs> and like they comment, they're looking in the mini fridge. It's like just cola, water, and peanuts. <laughs> Will Sasso is in this ep- episode also. Goodfellas and Casino are, are movies in this world hmm. somehow. I don't know. Don't and really they're on know. the Disney Channel. They actually say that too, <laughs> which is funny. There's also a very special guest star in this episode. You lead off, Max. So at this wedding that they're talking about where the two mafia families are going to marry, they've got a singer, a, uh, a certain musician is going to perform, Mel Torme, the, yes. the, the Velvet Fog himself and father of Tracy Torme, mm-hmm. uh, producer of the show. And uh, a lot of fun is, is had with that. Yeah. He's an informant. Yeah. For working FBI. for the FBI. Yeah. And he's a country singer in this world. Yeah, he's not a country singer in real life. It's not the only type of music that exists, apparent, I think, but mm-hmm. he's a country singer. There is a lot of country music throughout the episode, mm-hmm. yes. And, uh, and yeah, that's tons of fun. <laughs> he yeah. explodes at one point in the episode. It may, they, well, they, they try and kill him with a car bomb. They fail. He, they he survives, but... He also says to Quinn, you have a trustworthy face or something. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> something weird. <laughs> so you have that. But what makes this great, and I'll talk about it more, is it's just a believable. It, the the action is narrowed in, and there's a corrupt DA, and he's he's in the pocket of the mob, and they're trying to get him. Mm. Blah, blah blah blah. It's a great great. It's a fun little adventure. Doesn't really have to do much with the overarching story of the series, but it's fun. Yeah, yeah. Also, they have Uzis, I think, or or maybe they're Mac tens. I can't remember, but they have small submachine guns, which I like. Nice. Always love seeing those. But and this is and this doesn't imply. I'm just remembering something I should have brought up with like the Jillian of the spirits thing, sure, sure. and just bringing it back as I just remembered is that why would in any of those worlds why would any of the other countries in the world follow along with the U.S. Like what is it? The world government declared that you can't have technology anymore. Why would why wouldn't the Soviet Union be like this is a great opportunity to 
fucking steamroller you. <laughs> um, you're stuck in the 50s and it's 1975, you know, or something like that. The world government has declared that all women need to run things from now on. Yeah. Yes. Why does everyone go along with that? It's never explained. And I get it because they, they have only limited time and they probably wouldn't have a good explanation for why it happened like that. Mm-hmm. But I'm still going to complain about it. <laughs> it is what it is. Next is, oh man. Oh God. The Young and the Relentless, <laughs> which may have one of the stupidest. <laughs> Max, I want this one to, oh you God. take this one. When you, you talk about a premise that's crazy and a point of divergence, which is crazy. Uh, this is one of the, the wackiest. So this is a world where young people run everything. There's a lot of ageism in this world. The moment you turn 30 years old, you're basically forcefully retired and you're just a pariah of the state. The voting age, nine years old. <laughs> Once you turn nine, you're a full citizen. <laughs> and it's like... This kind of like uh, kind of Gordon Gecko Wall Street. Uh, yeah, everyone's ruthless capitalists out to get each other. Yeah, it's like American Psycho or whatever. And uh, oh my god, it has a watermark on it. <laughs> oh my god. That's Speaking good. of water, Quinn. It opens up with Quinn drowned in his swimming pool. His double. His double. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> oh no, Quinn died. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Good thing his brother is here to take over. Yeah, um, exactly. It turns out that Wade's double is evil, and she killed, she was married to Quinn. And there, yeah. yeah, she killed him. Spoiler alert! Be- and because of this whole conspiracy to implement this electronic training system for schools, that's like a terrible training system. Yeah, maybe the idea is that we don't need teachers because teachers are old. We need yeah. to get rid of old people so we have computers teach everybody. But, it, but it's funny, know. like they have like a problem from it. It's like, you have 12 bottles of Impact Cola and <laughs> you give seven away to your friend. How many bottles of Impact Cola do you have? It's like this hilarious, they play it like totally straight. And it is, that is funny. It's just an advertisement. Yeah, constant but advertising. The, the reason why this world switched over is said in 1980, people realized that the social security system was going to run out of money. So Howard Stern... Howard Stern runs for president and becomes president and makes the voting age nine. And who does he defeat? Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, finally. Yes. <laughs> A world we can all get behind. Um, <laughs> I had what? No, I had no idea that Howard Stern started his career in the 70s. That's yeah. crazy. Well, guess what? I think he was like in his late 20s in like 1980. Guess what? You have to be 35 to be president. So something else has changed in this world before even that. And is that in the, the Constitution? The Constitution. It is yeah, a constitutional okay. requirement written in plain letter. You have to be at least 35 years of age. Okay, so the point of divergence is at least in the 1770s. Yeah, I guess. 1780s. 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 Oh, right. But, sorry, sorry. But still. Of course. Uh, the... It's so stupid, and it's so stupid. And they said the, the reason that because the social security system is going to run out of money. Oh, I know how to fix that. I'll just make sure that people lose thirty to forty good working years to supply the system, and make sure that you can only work for twenty-one years between nine and thirty. This will fix everything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> screenwriters, you need to like learn about economics because this is actually going to create a worse problem. You're going to yeah. have a tremendous portion of the society that has no income and has no way to do anything and is just going to be sitting there even though they could be productive. To give this episode, to, to try to argue in favor of this very, very dumb premise, maybe the idea is to force old people to leave, go to a different country, get out of America. Well, they do say the retirement age is 40 in Florida. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so the flee there. <laughs> Refugees to the state of Florida. Um, As per usual, good Lord, so many people are moving to Florida these days. It's crazy. It is. But the only thing believable about this premise is that Howard Stern would do something that's stupid if he were president. Yeah. But also, the president can't unilaterally change the voting age. That's a constitutional amendment. Sure. Because they had to get a constitutional amendment to change it from 21 to 18. Uh, though executive orders do some pretty crazy sweeping yeah, things. But they couldn't do that because that's directly that. in the Constitution. Got it. All right. All Maybe right. they go by the Articles of Confederation in this country. I don't know. But it's stupid. There's this whole yeah. plot about this more corporate espionage. They love, there's like some writer on the staff. I wonder if it was the same writer who like loves corporate espionage <laughs> and like corporate backstabbing. You know. I got to tell you, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff kind of 
makes you know, me it would go be to funny sleep. If you had like a scene where they're talking about like, oh, uh, whatever this Quinn's company and they're like, oh, we got to meet with our we have to talk with the board of directors later. Like we have to decide, are we going to maintain our insurance policies or are we going to become a, a self-insured company? You know, it's stuff would <laughs> be funny to be like, we have to deal with this pension deficit. And it covers like, oh, we got sued in this. Yeah. Like we're going to let in-house counsel deal with this. Or we're going to have to farm this out to outside counsel. It'd be funny to hear like them being like this just completely <laughs> unrelated to <laughs> they're like oh are we privately we're privately held should we go corporate oh man we got to get underwritten and like okay we have to get evaluated and like what's our oh, wait what are we gonna it's just it would be funny to see like all this just completely unrelated to this sci-fi with the price of steel these days come on oh no yeah, that's right yeah oh. we're outsourcing to wherever why would any other country on this planet this this is the same thing with the jillian of the spirits why would any other country be like be like this country is ripe for the picking how stupid yeah. are they yeah Ugh. There's some good court scenes in this too. Oh my god, this whole season is court scene after court scene after mm-hmm. court scene, and it's all great. It's all lots of fun. Yeah, which you know, a, a court of law is mm-hmm. a great place to show wacky societies. Yeah, executing you for <laughs> tagging a an overpass, or <laughs> um, in this one, there's apparently no jury. You just plea, and the judge does whatever. Yeah, and the judge is like 18 years old. Oh my god, yeah, that's so. And he funny. has like drumsticks up on the on the when he's up on the bench. <laughs> And he calls him Babe. What's up, Babe? The, the, the PD. Yeah, the, the assistant PD. You should plead not guilty by reason of senility. They said that. That was really funny. They're like in great. their fifties. Yeah, the good old Arturo. And he's like a lawyer named Tracy Tiffany. Tiffany. That's it. Yeah. And there's a funny scene to escape from the fifteen-year-old who's like the prison guard. He fakes having a heart attack, and they like beat up this kid. <laughs> Which, you know, a society run by children, basically, is going to be disastrous. disastrous. It's going to be dysfunctional. So, yeah. They have a curfew for people over the age of 30. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> and they get off on a technicality because they didn't properly put their signage up. <laughs> ha ha, gotcha. Motion to dismiss. <laughs> um, just like... uh, I love it. A fun episode. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's fun. I um, wish Mel Torme was in this one. That would be great. Yeah. He's like in a prison. Like, let me out, please, <laughs> please. <laughs> ah, good stuff. Next up, oh, um, invasion, invasion. Oh boy, Cro-Mags. Oh, your favorite part of the show is introduced here. Uh, nice. This, I'm this... too angry to explain. You explain. <laughs> This is the only Cro-Mag episode I've seen, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's interesting. It starts off, they slide into a world. What's the divergence? It's not clear. They never find out, but it looks like our world, except that it's it's depopulated and there's graffiti all over the place. Judge Ida would be so mad if he saw this place. Yeah, everyone's Uh, getting executed on this planet. (laughs) He's he's like, I'm bringing my own lethal injection chemicals here. (laughs) He's got an M60 and he's just shooting. (laughs) It's like, ah. Um, Punisher, street sweeper. <laughs> and people have written Cro-Mag all over the place. Oh, the Cro-Mags are here. The end is near. You know, that kind of stuff. They encounter a bunch of mental patients who I guess have escaped. They're like one of the only people who are left alive uh, out in the open. And they basically explain entirely what, what has happened. Invaders have come, not from outer space, but from a different dimension. A world where some kind of archaic hominid has evolved in a different direction and homo sapiens has gone extinct. Mm -hmm. And these are like evil ape men who have telepathy and eat eyes. They mention specifically, they love to eat eyes. (laughs) They're big fans of eyes. (laughs) Uh. And they've got like basically spaceships that they fly around in and they've got weird direct energy technology. They're sliders. And they're also sliders, but they use red portals oh, instead of blue, blue ones yeah yeah oh you also need to mention before i forget about professor arturo's proclivities for entering the wormhole oh yes oh my god every time they sl- well every time they enter the episode he like falls on his ass and he's like oh oh this, uh. but um when he leaves it's so hysterical he like does backflips <laughs> and flying kicks and stuff <laughs> like it is so great why can't nobody just walks into the portal it's like they have to dive in yeah yeah they just don't walk like some they walk in very occasionally but yeah. usually they run in <laughs> but it's so funny yeah, looking. Like and especially walk. a guy like Artero, you know kind of a bigger guy it's just hysterical <laughs> 
Oh my God. <laughs> so you have that and the Cro-Mags come and they, they shoot down a Cro-Mag ship. They like turn on the, the, yeah, like the, the timer, the timer it. And, it, and it knocks down the ship and it kills a guy inside and they're looking through and they grab his like some bracelet off of him. There's organic metal, whatever the hell that whatever is. Whatever the hell that is. Organic metal. They, they grab this thing off the uniform that Chromags used to track them to the next world, which is New France. New France. Yeah, they go there. Arturo, not a fan of New France. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, the French. Oh. <laughs> and they talk about how like Britain is like this depressed wasteland and it's terrible and how good that you can escape to New France. Yeah. The cro come to this world, get them, and they transport them to some sort of interdimensional prison. Mm. And then they, they torture them and blah, blah, blah. And then they escape. And, it, and then the, the end thing is like, oh, and we put a tracking device in one of them. cro will not show up in season three, but they get heavy play, especially in four and then to a lesser degree, five. I'll say, I mean... This is a somewhat interesting episode. The The concept is kind of intriguing. The idea of there being other sliders who are bad is kind of interesting. But I can also totally understand how they can get misused and overused. They do get overused. And I didn't watch any of the other ones. So, you know, I, I don't know. They really... do get overused. Those are some of the weaker episodes because it's there's, there's just, you know. And they're really science fiction-y, I guess. And if yeah. your budget is low, I bet that looks pretty dumb. It does. Yeah. Okay. So... This episode, not bad. Interesting episode. But we get to the last episode that we'll really be fleshing. Oh, we'll flesh out a few more, but the last of season two, Mm -hmm. which is as time goes by, it's set in three different worlds. um, And in each world, Quinn encounters this woman who he had like a crush on in high school. And she was the one who got away. Yeah. Dalen. And it's an interesting dynamic in each world. She she's in like a different relationship with him or whatever. Like Mm -hmm. it's kind of neat the way they all interplay off of each other. The first world is Nueva España, and they they have to work like day laborer jobs as illegal immigrants from Canada. <laughs> Which, you know, they're still in Vancouver, so that's kind of funny that <laughs> I know, right? the Canada reference. Yeah. But yeah, one of the fellow day laborers turns out to be the husband of the lady that Quinn likes. Yeah. He gets like killed or kidnapped yeah, or something. Yeah, he turns out kidnapped, and they, they, they get right? captured by the authorities, but Quinn escapes and he's trying to free them. And then his Charlie O'Connell shows up as like a secondary character. Jerry O'Connell. Please. Char- Charlie. Char- no, Charlie does. Charlie does? Yeah, he's the... Oh my God. He's the guy who gets shot and then, you know, it's like, oh, it's my brother, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> uh, but... There's a funny part. The judge that deports him back to Canada is Judge Ramon Estevez. Okay, okay. Ramon Estevez. Oh, right. (laughs) Does not look like Ramon Estevez, but it is pretty funny. Which Sheen is that? Martin? That's Martin. Martin Sheen. I love it. (laughs) Also, oh God, that's fantastic. And then he goes, they go to a backwards world. Like they go to another world where it's like the San Francisco Lions world. That seems to be the main difference. Yeah. I guess there's the Detroit 49ers. Yeah. Oh, God. (laughs) That doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't. Yeah. Minor 49er is why that's named. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, in the third one, it's backwards, which I was surprised by. It was kind of a fun twist. Yeah, time goes backwards. So I guess they're at the exact point they're at is the exact halfway mark in time. It's It's stupid. It's very dumb, actually. And they actually (laughs) like destroy the universe because they cause a paradox. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the chief justice of the Supreme Court. They do mention that. And it's got weird CGI effects when it's doing like the record skipping, like going backwards and people are like doing this weird. (laughs) You'll you'll see more weird later. Yeah. It's a good it's a good one to end on. It's not a bad it's not a bad episode. And it shows that meddling and stuff can cause consequences. It's also fun when you see multiple slides in an episode. And a lot of times you'll think back and say, oh, man, that was kind of cool. That could have made a full episode. Mm-hmm. But then again, the fact that it wasn't a full episode. Could you probably... really make a full episode out of the San Francisco Lions world? <laughs> no. <laughs> it is funny because it's spray painted on a bench. Yeah. So, yeah. But now we've covered the first two seasons episode by episode. Mm-hmm. We'll talk a little bit about some of the interesting things in three, four, and five. The production moved to L.A. starting in three. And really seasonal rot steps in. Yeah, it is remarkably different right off the bat. If you're going to watch this series, I recommend you watch the first two seasons. If you want to venture into the other stuff to have a good laugh sometimes, you you know, go be my guest. But like, don't expect the quality to be as good. There's like some flashes of brilliance, Mm -hmm. but it's not great. (laughs) For the most part, yeah. Technically, the first episode of the third season is Double Cross, which... It aired second. Yeah, yeah, because it wasn't interesting enough, I guess. But I watched that episode 
that one's kind of it's mildly interesting but also very obvious of the bad things that are coming Mm -hmm. uh they go to a world where they're figuring out sliding Mm -hmm. it's this crappy world with lots of resource shortages they say that horses are on the endangered species list and los angeles and san francisco have combined into one city yes san San angeles yeah 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 um what else Oh, um, oh, the crying man is popular in this world. He is one of the worst worlds they've ever been to. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, and he like meets this like obsessed stalker fan who's like, "I have all this money. My father invented the paperless toilet, the seashells, I guess. <laughs> I, I suppose, yes. <laughs> and you have to pay extra to use a toilet with water because water is so scarce. I guess gas is like four hundred dollars a gallon or something like that. Yeah, kind of, kind of wacky, but yeah. Um, and then the scientist who's working on building a sliding machine is revealed through the course of the episode to be Quinn's double, though this person is a woman. Yeah. So this is the first time we've had a double that is remarkably different from the main one. But they figure this out, at least the bad guys do, because their heat scans are the same. Oh, your heat signature is exactly the same as, as Quinn. It's like... What does that mean? What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about you're physiologically completely different so what is going on here your heats your heat ugh ugh so bad yep so bad and like at the beginning like there's a, an action scene for literally no reason <laughs> it's just we need this episode to be interesting so car chase that, that's the big thing is that the show turns much more into an action show in the last three seasons which is a bad idea because it doesn't have the budget to have good, action impressive scenes, action. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And long story short, they stopped the, the, and they set her up to be like a recurring villain, but she never was. Yeah. They like kick her through the portal or something like that. Yeah. And she follows them to another world, but she changes the, the, she changes something about their timer. So instead of landing in San Francisco, they land, they can land anywhere in a 400 mile radius. So they start landing in LA conveniently because they start filming in LA. <laughs> also, that 400 mile radius turns into 500 mile radius out of nowhere for some reason. Cause I watched a later episode and they say, I can land anywhere within 500 miles. Yeah. Huh? Continuity. Come on. Who cares? This um, is simple stuff, people. So then they there's another episode, Rules of the Game, mm. where it's basically like a free for all. Like you have to shoot out with these different teams and like win a money prize. It's it's like a battle royale or whatever. I I feel like there's a scene in that where there's like a a sprinkler in someone's front lawn, except it's like shooting lasers. Yeah, yeah. And and stupid. And Arturo is sticking a pen in it to stop it. And I I imagine that is the moment when John Rhys Davies is like, I want to leave this show. Yeah. (laughs) I I think I might be done. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's stupid. (laughs) And and the the bad guys they fight are like robot thing. Oh, it's stupid. But they also land on a. It looks like they land on a plane. It actually turns out it's not a plane. It's like a simulation of a plane oh interesting yeah um, i was quite confused by it w- that it would be funny why, how do they make sure that they don't land in like the middle of the ocean like this <laughs> or why don't how do they make sure that their vortex doesn't open at thirty thousand feet oh my god could you imagine that in an episode <laughs> like oh <laughs> <laughs> well something i constantly wonder about is sliding to a world where there's no atmosphere and there's no air yeah and like what do you do? You just die. There's no- yeah, the end of the episode. They're just like floating in space, like frozen. <laughs> that that's the true end of sliders, I guess. But yeah, what what the hell? Some later season three episodes include the Dragon World, where a guy can turn into a dragon. Oh no! And there, I showed you right before we recorded the fight scene. It's pretty bad. <laughs> I almost feel bad making fun of it. It's so bad. Oh man. Yeah, dragon slide. Then there's a world where with sentient fire. I don't even want to start. Oh my god! And it's like the worst CGI ever. For you the... showed me a little bit of that, and oh boy, <laughs> oh no! Oh a world dear. where Rembrandt gets pregnant. Men can get pregnant. So they have to carry the last part of the tri. Oh my, the third trimester, and they create in a false and a fake womb because women can't have to. It was so stupid. <laughs> I I had many questions about the pregnancy thing. Specifically, does the man deliver the child? You know, through a canal uh and i think it's c-section uh thankfully also it's a monarchy and everyone carries swords you told me that too. yeah thomas jefferson became king or something or something <laughs> i don't know i don't know um but 
We do have to explore Slide Like an Egyptian, because you did watch this one. I did. I did watch this one. I, I only watched a handful from three and four just because they were not so good. And I got suggestions from you. And this is one I watched on a lark. And oh, my God. The premise <laughs> is that America is run by Egyptians. Ancient Egyptians, basically. Not Hosni Mubarak. <laughs> Though there is someone named Mubarak there in the is. episode. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Dr. Mubarak. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But Gavel Nasser, <laughs> President of America. <laughs> it's also unclear, like, what's the history of this ancient Egypt? They say that uh, Arturo is like, some say that Alexander the Great put an end to the Egyptians, but I guess Alexander the Not So Great is what he was in this world. Yeah, except the place is named New Alexandria that they're in. So, what Alex are you naming this after if he's not so great, oh my Egyptians? Gosh. Come on. Give me a break. It's funny because you're like, there's like downtown LA and they've like photoshopped in like pyramids and shit like that. <laughs> they've gone to like the, the Shriners temple or whatever. Everyone wears fezes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no. The, and then the Nuwabian Moors have, they were right all along. <laughs> oh no. Oh my God. And I, I feel like I, I, this may not be true, but I swore I remember the mailboxes are like pyramids too. There's, there's definitely hieroglyphs on them. I remember that. I don't remember the pyramids. I think and, they, but everyone speaks English in this world too. Why do they speak English? Why? <laughs> For it's, what? It's reason? funny to see some like meathead Southern California actor being like, we're here to take the pharaohs. He's like dressed in this weird fez. Like we're here to take the pharaoh's body to the pyramids. It's just <laughs> there's a giant bug. <laughs> there's a giant scarab. Oh my god! Man eating scarab. It's quote unquote genetically engineered. That's a lot of genetic engineering to make it the size of a refrigerator. Yeah. Uh, and there's a rotating oh, no. pyramid, and there's a oh. Dr. Mubarak. They kill Quinn and then bring him back because they're obsessed with life after death. Hmm. And also, this world has invented sliding. And right. they, they run out. Their timer runs out on this world, so they have to take the Egyptian slider. So now, it instead of looking like a cell phone, it looks like a remote control to slide. The- yeah, it looks like a Comcast remote is what it looks like. I think maybe Stargate had come out, and they thought, hmm, Egyptians, let's do that. Yeah. So Slide like an Egyptian. <laughs> Some of the stock footage they use for like the cityscape or whatever, they show this black glass pyramid. I think that's in Memphis. They're, they have a pyramid over there that they built because, you know, Memphis, Egypt, a connection. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. they did that. And now that pyramid is a Bass Pro Shops. So there's a big Bass Pro Shops logo on it. it I got to show you a picture of it. It's hysterical. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> but this is one of the dumbest worlds that we've seen. Yeah, and the idea is kind of fun, but it doesn't make any sense. Well, and also like pyramids were of only a particular portion of Egyptian history. Mm. Like that was the old kingdom. Yeah. Like the new kingdom, the greatest era of Egypt, you could like Amenhotep the third, Ramses the second. They were not building pyramids. Mm. Like Karnak is not a pyramid. There's a way you could make this work. Maybe like there's people are just aping the ancient Egyptians. Like these are mm-hmm. um, these this. That's, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm struggling. Don't try to and the it's so stupid. <laughs> <sighs> and then we get to the world mm-hmm. where the professor dies. Yeah. There's it's a world where the pulsar is about to hit the earth, and they're on a military base, and they're trying to help these people slide out. Mm-hmm. And this is where Carrie Wurr's character gets introduced. The great Carrie Wurr. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then the bad guy is. Colonel Angus Rickman, and Colonel Rickman is the highest ranking Englishman in the American (laughs) army, for sure. He's played by Roger Daltrey of The Who, although it later switches to some other actor when he becomes a recurring villain for like the last part of this season. Mm. Um, But he has a brain parasite that he got in the Gulf War, so he has to inject people's (laughs) brain or spinal fluid into him so he doesn't die. So all these people are in a coma, like all these people are falling into comas on this military base and no one seems the wiser. I think Arturo says, hmm, 40 people go into a coma in the course of just three months. That seems a little suspicious, don't yeah. you think? And when, and not only when he, he steals this fluid, he then injects it to himself, but his face turns into the person's face <laughs> that he took the fluid from. <laughs> Fuck you, this story. <laughs> How long does that take effect? Did they explain? Like for 10 seconds. Oh, Oh, my God. There's a lot of things about that that don't make sense. When we first see it happen, he's doing it to a black lady, and mm-hmm. then he be- his face becomes a black woman's face, <laughs> which begs a lot of questions. Is it just the face that changes, or is the whole body changing? Uh, 
<laughs> is, Who knows? Do you change your height? Do you, does he grow inches and not? Does he grow breasts? Does, does he, he grow, grow female organs? Does he like if he if he took the if he took brain fluid from a guy who was seven feet tall, would he then grow to be seven feet? T- it's it's dumb. It's why, dumb. Why, why does his hair change? Why? It's Why stupid. does his clothing change as well? Well, he attacks the professor and he doesn't get all of his brain fluid, but the professor is now like he can barely function. Mm-hmm. And then the colonel tries to shoot Quinn, but is these people are escaping right before the pulsars. And then the professor steps in front of the bullet and he dies, although it's a fake professor. So mm-hmm. we can still bring the other one back. The Carrie were her husband who gets murdered by the, the colonel too. Mm-hmm. So they, she joins the sliders and they go to zombie world. Oh, no, it was That's a fat real? supplement that turns everyone to zombies. Oh. God. And then um, they go to um, what else is there? They go to um, Dragon World. I know that. N- no, they know no, that, that was before. They already did. Uh, oh, they go dinosaur world. Another dinosaur world. Yeah. Yay. Um, they awesome. go to Vampire World, where <laughs> Richard Nixon is the most famous vampire. <laughs> oh, no. oh my God! Why? It's so bad. Tommy Chong plays Professor Van Helsing in it. That's kind of funny. <laughs> it is funny. Uh, so, but bad. still, that's so bad. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. How how, do, how does this guy die? Well, in the last episode, he basically rips off the island of Doctor Moreau, and there's like these half human hybrids, and he like Colonel Rickman is turned into one of them. He's got like all this weird bad fur painted onto his face, and he goes ooh like a bird, like a dog and um or wolf, I guess. And Michael York, who is Basil in the Austin Powers movies, okay, and he literally sucks the entire scenery through a straw the whole time with <laughs> with glee and vigor and it is amazing he just devours it and he is just the most over the top he out brando's brando um which is a tall order which is a tall order um in this um this is really so bad it's good um <laughs> But um, long story short is they finally have their coordinates to get home and they're going to go. But Colonel Rickman attacks. Uh, Quinn shoves Rembrandt and Wade through the portal and um, he helps Maggie. And Colonel Rickman tries to jump after the portal, but it's closed and he falls off a cliff and falls on some rocks and dies. Okay. Uh, All right. But then Quinn and Maggie slide on to like a futuristic world. And then in the next season, they find Remy. And they've already fired Sabrina Lloyd by this point. So oh. there's no, or she left, whatever. So cro took over Earth Prime, but it turns out that Quinn's really from another planet and he what? has a brother and blah, 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 well, blah, blah. Well, I knew about the brother. And they go find Charlie O'Connell, his brother, and you want to see some real acting. Um, <laughs> oh, which brings up, we totally forgot from the second season, that great opening to Great Fellows where they go to the lawyer world. Oh yeah, that was great. More more trial and law well, stuff. I love well, it. Well, it's not trial, but they like try and go. It's a world where eighty four percent of the population goes to law school, <laughs> which is funny. They try and order food at a restaurant, and then he's like, "I want a burger with fries and a drink." He's like, "Well, I need your carbonated beverage release forms, your salmonella insurance, and you know proof of this amount of insurance." And they're like, "Oh no, never and then, mind." And then Remy tries to order it, and he's like, "Well, how about just the fries?" And he's like, "Well, I just need some picture ID and a doctor's note certifying that you're." cholesterol is under 200 and he's like well how am i who carries that he's like the, it's just fun. it's just ridiculous yeah yeah the, the, the logic of this world doesn't make any and sense and then there's quinn's reading the review of a Polly shore movie and like even the critic is like some people say Polly shore is the world's worst actor some say he's the greatest i, I take no position on this <laughs> this paper has no position and it's like this in no way represents the views of the parent company of this it's just uh <laughs> there's personal injury liability stuff like somebody bumps into someone else and it's like you're going to court yeah this rembrandt bumps into a, this lady it's like a a little bump you know like any of us have ever done and she starts like it's like oh no i'm sore and then this they like go in the back and this guy runs behind him he's like you're gonna need a lawyer and he hands him and it's like a law firm with like a zillion names it's like 20 names um and and he's like that lady's filing a collision suit against you and he's like he's like and you did the wrong thing by admitting guilt by saying you were sorry you're lucky she hasn't sued you for sexual harassment and this is like 30 seconds after it's happened <laughs> I know that's a thing with medical stuff that doctors don't apologize for things because you can argue that you're liable if you ad- you admit guilt. Uh, you I do don't that. know. I, I okay. don't want to. Yeah. I, I that was an NPR thing I heard at some point. 
but but um that e- was great either way yeah so but go back to so they find charlie o'connell and he's not a, and they go to like and one of them's a world where drug use is mandatory oh no <laughs> um you, you must do drugs yeah pretty much um and then they go there's the california reich is probably the only good episode of that season i've seen it yeah i, I, wa- I did watch that one at your recommendation and you know uh rembrandt doing some acting mm-hmm. you know it's a weighty subject the subject is everyone's racist it's a racist world <laughs> it is so it's called california reich the episode but hitler didn't exist there yeah. is no nazi germany which makes you wonder why do they have ss runes tattooed on their arms what's going on oh, here who knows who knows but yeah weimar republic world the weimar republic still going strong is that real i don't i don't okay, know okay all right yeah that but that sounds like a real they're thing. rounding up all of the minorities and they're turning them into weird automatons to yeah. do work for people like robot slave things and the governor's name is schick schick governor schick governor schick governor gillette is running against him um one wonders all right so like at the end of the episode they expose what's going on it's like, look at this. This lady's half robot. You know, this is what's happening to the migrants. Then they slide out. And I think most people are like, yeah, we knew that. <laughs> it was obvious. We started deporting people. And then all these robot slave things started mopping the floor everywhere. Yay. Schick, 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 schick. I like one scene that they're like, are you from the ACLU? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Woof. Stupid. But, uh, there is one world in the fourth season, a different episode, where it talks about like you, the UN and Mexico have invaded California or something like that. Not the UN invading. Oh, God. Oh, no. But their army, their very strong and powerful army. Their army, and they're going to make me drink corn syrup. No. <laughs> no, nah, not like a good American. <laughs> it's a good thing that the UCC code protects me. <laughs> <laughs> the Universal Commercial Code is going to. Uniform Commercial Code. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> The, no, now it's the universal so code. code. That's yes. right. That's right. I'm so glad I know how to deliver items, like how to properly formulate a base contract to deliver items for sale or do um, secured transactions. <laughs> I, I am love a that corporation with the with the, um, with the sovereign citizen people that they don't like. They don't acknowledge the government, but for some reason acknowledge the UCC, which is the basis of almost all mainstream contractual law in the United States, except in Louisiana because they follow code law yeah napoleon yes yeah yes, that's why you yes. have to have a picture of napoleon the third up everywhere you go in louisiana <laughs> no um napoleon the the sixth like in that story oh yeah that map oh my god that war of 95 yeah, map is amazing so good yeah, oh my goodness it. they've conquered canada thank god thank goodness thank i was god. worried did they conquer canada i don't know they did oh thank god oh, thank god Ah, yes. Um, I I was actually kind of wondering about that because, like, the Commonwealth, what what are you doing on the northern border there? Yeah. Mystery solved. All right. I like it. So, the fourth season, we told you how Quinn gets merged and blah, 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 you know. And there's, like, an evil scientist who's, like, kind of the bad guy the last season. Uh, Wait, wait. Let me stop you there. I got a quick question. Because in California Reich, Charlie O'Connell, he mentions... I'll drive. You know how to drive? Yeah, just like on my steam car back at home. Where did he come? Did he come from S.M. Sterling's steam, steampunk world? Nah, he came from like Amish world. Amish world. So steam power is okay to these Amish. I, I don't know. All right. Okay. All right. Sorry, sorry. Showing off those acting chops, Charlie. <laughs> um, Has he done anything else? Uh, he was in Dude, Where's My Car? And he was on a season oh. of The Bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> was he The Bachelor? He was. Wow. I wondered. I consulted with an expert on this. Yes, I think I know who you're talking about. Um, <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> it's not me either. Um, um, and uh, confirmed, indeed, he was on The Bachelor. Interesting. Okay. Huh. And Jerry's like, well, he could have been in Kangaroo Jack, I guess. <laughs> um, um, oh, but uh, he could have been the kangaroo, you know? You never know. So in the fifth yeah. season, they have all these new characters. There's a couple things worth mentioning in the, the the final season. One is in the very last episode, they go to a world that like worships the sliders, and this the the head of it is supposed to be like kindly, but he's like, "You need to stay here. You can't leave because you have to help me found my religion of slideology." What? Which is really stupid. Oh no! Um, the, the fans of sliders they created, they created a, religion. a religion, and he's like, "It's this isn't a big deal. Just help me found this religion." Um, <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> but um, there's one where they go to a world where red meat, tobacco, and caffeine have been banned by the Gephardt Act. Gephardt? Like Dick Gephardt, the congressman Don't from Missouri. Who's that? Don't know him. He was a potential presidential candidate and vice presidential candidate in the 80s and 90s, but... He he just didn't like yeah. smoking or... No, and I, no, I think that's not even connected to him at all. I think they just picked a random <laughs> politician name. Okay. <laughs> um, and then you have the only one worth watching, which is A Current Affair. I did watch this one, yes. What, what did you think, Max? It, the first thing I thought is, what what's going on? Why does Quinn look like this? Who is this lady? What is happening? Oh, no. But once I got over that... The, the divergence here is that the president is here. He seems very similar to Bill Clinton. And he's giving he is. He's an XB. He's like Jefferson Williams is his name. Jefferson Williams. <laughs> like William yeah. Jefferson Clinton. <laughs> right, right. There's reporters and they're asking him weird questions like, do you sleep in the nude and stuff like that? Like this is a world where journalism is just stupid. Yeah. Well, mainstream journalism is like tabloid journalism pretty yeah, much. It's yeah. not even yellow journalism. All they're obsessed about is the president having an affair or blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. Maggie gets pushed in the president's arms accidentally. And all of a sudden within 10 minutes, all the newspapers are reporting they're having an affair and <laughs> stuff like that. And they talk about this is a wider world than just that because mm-hmm. there's a war. There's a war that the president uses. He uses the scandal to distract from the war in Switzerland, Max. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. You you mentioned this in a previous episode. Yeah. that like, Marcel Vosch, the butcher of something. The Bern. butcher of Bern. Yes. He's, he's, there's ethnic cleansing in the French parts of Switzerland, and he's nationalized the Swiss banks. Oh, no. And now America's attacked. Although it's interesting. It's funny. Like I think they unintentionally got this right when they were like, America's losing this war in Switzerland. And I think they did it in there to be like, oh, what a crazy world. Switzerland's beating the U.S. But mm. Switzerland would actually be an incredibly difficult country to invade and attack Mm-mm-mm. because everyone there is armed. All the men. And there's mandatory conscription hmm. and it's got one of the best natural defenses in the world it's like situated in the alps other than the area around geneva it would be incredibly hard to capture it yeah yeah there's there's uh there's a bunch of swiss army training films that are on youtube and they're excellent they're so good i showed you a little bit of one yeah like i really the, liked it the pain the pains are faust and stuff mm-hmm. um pains are shreks i should say really good watch them <laughs> but uh but yeah this episode and they're going to use Noxin gas. Noxin gas. Yes, yes. And uh, they use this as a wag the dog kind of thing. But it's a reverse wag the dog. It's it not that let's do a war to distract from my sex scandal. It's, it's let's, let's do, do a it. sex scandal to distract from this terrible war. Yeah. Kind of a funny and idea. And then they decide to like, they kid- basically the Secret Service kidnaps Maggie and then they try and kill her, but they accidentally kill somebody else and they're trying to cover it up mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they make it so that the president's like a murderer and he gets out and he does a press conference where he's like, I did not have homicidal relations with that woman. Oh, this is clearly not Bill Clinton. Um, <laughs> homicidal relations. <laughs> no one describes it like that. That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> yeah. I really liked they they do some photo manipulation oh, yeah. in this episode and I you know I like messing around with pictures like that's kind of a hobby of mine and it's just so funny the jargon they use it's like that might be a dot tiff or it could be a dot png and uh, they also are like hmm if it's a jpeg it's going to look blurry when we blow it and this might be rasterized and like, what are you guys talking about? This is so goofy. But I guess Photoshop was really different in the year 2000. So, yeah, you know. Oh, my God. It's like this whoa, wild and crazy thing. Um, this is the only episode worth. There's like one where they go to a world where like aluminum isn't in, was never discovered. That's so like kind of interesting. It I is. Guess. So like boats are the main way of getting around and planes are like in 1930s level technology. All right. There's another one where they go to this island and there's this monastery and like the world has collapsed. There was like this large world government mm-hmm. overthrown by things called the Volsangs. Volsang? And the Volsangs show up later and they look like a bunch of village people rejects land on a beach <laughs> with, with, with fake rubber guns. Um, and, and, uh, are these guys sliders or what? No, they're they're just, they're supposed to be like Mongols or something like that. But like the, the monastery has to protect itself and they have all these great works of literature or civilization they want to protect. And Diana, the new slider, the black lady, she's like, use this laser to encode it on this giant crystal. And they take the crystal with them, but they forgot to take a way to read it. So now (laughs) they have... You have a big ass crystal that's filled with technology information that you can never access. That's hysterical. 
<laughs> but that's kind of an interesting idea. Like, that's kind of neat. Where did this lady come from? What's her deal? Um, she was an assistant scientist helping that scientist who shot the guy into the wormhole that blew up Quinn. Oh. Um, and she decides to help them. Okay. All right. Dr. Geiger. Geiger. Interesting. All right. Oberon Geiger. Oberon. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. Um, uh, trying to think if there's any other fifth season. There's um, not much... Yeah, the the fifth season's weak. Four and five are really weak. Three is three is actually bad in some ways too. Really so bad. What would be the worst out of the three? Do you think? Three at times is the worst actually. Five like they've kind of given up. So there's at times it's not as bad. Yeah, like the uh, the Switzerland episode, the A Current Affair. It feels really cheap. Like they yeah. don't really do. It. Well, they shot it like at a hotel or something like that. Yeah, and they just there, use the hotel for. There's everything. like no props, no maps. No wacky yeah. stuff. It's just pretty straight laced. It went to sci-fi, I think, for the last two seasons. So their production, their their uh-huh. their budget went way down. That makes sense. That's why they're using all the damn sets. They keep repeating them. I see it. Okay, I'm looking at the list of episodes. I see a to catch a slider. Is, oh yeah. Is that a to catch a thief or a to catch a predator to reference? Because <laughs> if it's to catch a predator, <laughs> that'd be pretty funny. <laughs> Now you say you slid in here. A, <laughs> oh, God. Oh God. Well, overall, it ends on a cliffhanger. Rembrandt's trying to get back to his world, and he's going to take this anti-chromag virus, but these people want to keep him on this for the slideology world. That's whatever. Oh, if you want to watch it, go ahead, but it's <laughs> dumb. Um, uh-huh. But they should bring this series back, and they should probably just ignore like the last two seasons. They should come up with some excuse that like those were actually different sliders, and you didn't even know it. You, you could make some excuse like, when they slid uh, at the end of the second season, the portal uh, forked and mm-hmm. d- doubles of them went on. And then there's these new doubles. And then for some reason, it took 20 years for them to come out the other side or something stupid like that. Yeah, that could work. Yeah. And then, you know, they age or something because like mm-hmm. carrying on like what happened? What happened to Wade? Oh, um, she got turned into like a floating brain in a jar to man some sort of chromag weapon, and then she oh. blows herself up to save humanity. Or it's really dumb. Oh, that sucks. That's too bad. <laughs> uh, and then Arturo, obviously, you know, brain sucking. You yeah, know, brain yeah. sucking and shot, and they just kind of dropped a whole bus on him. Then he got blown up by the pulsar. Poor Charlie just disappeared. Um, yeah, but overall. I mean, it's got its strengths. It's got its weaknesses. I think that the best worlds, I would say, are the most believable ones. Are yeah. Funny enough, it's the Great Fellows one. As insane as it sounds, the South Australia one in some ways. <laughs> yeah. I um, mean, and it, the uh, Texas one. Those are the worlds that you can imagine a world beyond the scope of the show that makes sense. Dragon World does not make sense. <laughs> Don't you say that they say that the laws of physics are different there or something? Nay, it's with their speculation or something like that. Because mm-hmm. a man turns into a hawk and then a guy turns into a dragon and then he turns into a cockroach. It's so stupid. The cockroach. It's so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What are your parting thoughts on it? Um, this is a show that had a ton of potential. Like I said, I went back to the first and second season to watch the episodes I didn't watch the first time. And... Uh, it was a real f- breath of fresh air to go back to the well to see those better episodes. Mm-hmm. And it really does impress upon you the the potential that this show delivered on a little bit, but it had so much more it could have done. I, it's just a shame that it kind of meandered and kind of went off track. But uh, I think a, a reboot, if they do it, would be really cool. Mm-hmm. They could even do a soft reboot where it's completely different people and the people from the original are just supporting characters who show up, make a cameo, or yeah. for some reason they're just out of the picture most of the time. I don't know. But I, I think it's really nice. I, mm-hmm. I And it was fun watching this show that I kind of remember as a kid. Um, hmm. Yeah, no, it's hard. To, I, I couldn't find it. It was on Netflix for years and years, and then it went off of Netflix like seven or eight years ago. And then it wasn't until I had rediscovered a couple months ago that it was on Peacock that you could watch more of it. So yeah, yeah. But um, overall, we've explored its faults and its merits. I think quite <laughs> extensively, but <laughs> but it I deserved it. it. Damn it, it, it deserved. deserved it. Yes. So um, well, thank you for listening. If you're interested, go watch the show. Mm-hmm. This is Matt signing off, and this is Max signing off. Have a good day, guys. Mm.